Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I'm said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of April 11, 2024, including... A long-standing member of Team Xbox has left the company this week as word of a new Gears game begins to surface. Sarah Bond has assembled a team dedicated to bringing video game preservation. Hellblade 2 is facing some frame rate related controversy and more. On this day in Xbox history, in the year 2012, 12 years ago, The Splatters was released for Xbox Live Arcade on the Xbox 360 in the US. A little uh, gooey, puzzle solving, XBLA type game. Nothing to say about that. I don't know. We just keep. I feel like it's like every day. I'm like, oh, let's see what happened on this day in Xbox gaming history. I look at like the day before, and it's like Halo came out. And then it's like, oh, I look at the day afterwards, and it's like. Uh, Gears of War came out, and then I look at the day the podcast goes live, and it's like Squid Tastic came out for Xbox Live in Uruguay. And I'm like, fuck me. <laughs> so sorry, I got nothing to say about the Splatters, uh, but the Splatters sounds like uh, a violent, a violent series of battles one would receive after drinking uh, too much sugary wine I, on a Friday evening. I don't, I don't fucking know, but the, the, the Splatters came out, guys. Welcome to Xbox On episode. 254. Mike Clark writes in and says, Oh no, another week of gamers hating video games. Hashtag, but my frames. We will get into that, Mr. Mike Clark. Gamers do, gamers do hate video games. Spoiler alert. Uh, people, fans hate everything they like. That's that's what I've noticed. I Literally right before I'm recording the podcast, I'm doing a quick, you know, I, I always do a cursory little search right before the podcast starts every week. Like, uh, let me check VGC, let me check Twitter, let me, you know, because you never know. It's like, I'm about to record the podcast. I got all my notes together. I think I'm ready, but it's been a few hours since I checked the news. So who knows? Something could happen. Like, Phil Spencer has just acquired the McDonald's Corporation for $27 billion. You know, you, you, you never know. So I always do a little cursory search real quick just to make sure nothing crazy's happening um and um th- there's you know while i'm checking twitter or x or whatever to to just kind of make sure there's no controversy nothing i need to make sure i touch on uh before we hit record i just see it's like everything it's like i on, my twitter is like it, it's like a couple disney related things a couple video game related things a couple like baseball related things and i i, I just love it man because i'm just i'm scrolling here for like two seconds and then i ended up getting stuck in here for like 10 minutes and it's just people bitching they, they bitch about everything mr mr mike clark if, if i'm looking at my video game stuff people are bitching about the frame rates in in uh in hellblade 2 if i'm looking at my disney shit on on here people are bitching about rumors about things that haven't even been announced yet and complaining about things from 20 years ago it's just everyone's everyone is an insufferable asshole what do you want what should we do about it mike clark i say we send him to the send him to the gulag and then from there, the guillotine. And from there, what's something else that sounds like like a GU type of sound? And then from there, send them to Papua New Guinea. Anyway, guys, welcome to episode 254 of the Xbox On podcast. We got a lot of news this week. We actually got a, a healthy chunk of news. It's uh, I feel like it's an inverse of what we've been having lately, where there's a lot of small news stories and not a whole lot of big news stories. This week is like a decent kind of medium light amount of small stories, but a lot of big stories to talk about. So, and it's not like an obnoxious big stuff. Like the Microsoft is in court fighting the FTC right now. It's like normal shit. Like, uh, this person left the company. This person uh, just announced this thing, and there's a new initiative. And this video game has this controversial feature. So we're talking about video games again. That's that's kind of nice, you know. I miss that. I say we, we we celebrate this momentous occasion by getting right on into our mildly amusing stories, updates, stories that help warm us up and, and whet our appetite as we get into a week full of Xbox fun. Let's talk about Ninja Theory a little bit. We're not getting into the frame rate debate just yet. We'll talk about that in the main news segment. But just to kind of start us off, unfortunately, Ninja Theory developer of Hellblade uh, has been in the news quite a bit this week, and, and mostly not for the right, you know, for for good reasons. Uh, I'm sad to say, but 
Let's start out with a little bit of unfortunate news where Ninja Theory co-founder Tamim Antoniades, I'm sorry, Antoniades has left the company, fuck me, uh, on a recent visit to Cambridge UK-based studio for a Hellblade 2 preview, uh, website Polygon Polygon noted that there was no sign or mention of, of the man anywhere, uh, whether at, at his former company um, as chief creative director or anything. A spokesperson for Xbox, which is, of course, the parent company of Ninja Theory, later confirmed to the site that he had no longer been with the team, and VGC has contacted Microsoft to request further info on his departure. While his work... Well, he's worked on numerous games at Ninja Theory. Antoniades, Antoniades notably served as writer-director on Heavenly Sword, a PlayStation 3 exclusive that's super badass that I wish Ninja Theory would make more games like. Uh, enslaved Odyssey to the West, DMC Devil May Cry, and Hellblade Senua Sacrifice. According to website Polygon, he has been involved in the early stages of Hellblade 2, but the game is now being led by three creative leads, environmental artist director Dan Atwell, visual effects director Mark Slater, and and audio director David Garcia. Uh, Microsoft and Ninja Theory, of course, announced Hellblade 2 all the way back in the uh, late 2019 time period, a little simple time back when uh, back when people thought that Rise of the Resistance was going to change the theme park industry forever and that no one would ever wear a piece of cloth covering their face, and nor would, would doing so be a controversial thing to do. But plans change, things change. Now we're halfway through a new Xbox generation, and we got absolutely... Uh, nothing to show for it, man. Halo Infinite, a flop. Xbox is in the trash. To be honest, video games suck. I don't even know why I spend 30 hours a week playing them and 20 hours a week talking about them online. I hate video games. I'm insufferable. I've never been happy. Uh, and my dog is adopted. So what do you what do you want? What do you want? Okay. All right. Obviously not much to say about this other than a little weird to sweep this under the rug and maybe not make public mention that the guy who's kind of been a big a, a big pillar of this team, a co-founder, a creative director on your on your most notable games um, has just been gone for years and no one knew it until just now. I mean, that's that is weird. I mean, maybe it's a personal private related matter and that, you know, in that regard, it's like, of course, yeah, show some respect. But I mean, the guy's been gone for like years. So what, what the fuck's going on here? Uh, anyway, that's not setting the greatest precedent. Obviously, Hellblade 2 has been in development for a very long time, and we have seen lots of little previews for it and never anything super in-depth. So it's it's not to say that his lack of involvement is the reason why the game's taken so long or why we haven't seen too much of the game or why, you know, whatever the controversial takes as to what the game looks like and is uh, is what it is. I don't, I don't really blame that on him uh, or his lack of involvement in the project, but... It is a, I don't know, I, I guess I just find everything about Hellblade 2 weird. It's like, this is the game they announced the console with. You think it would have been like a heavy hit or something that they thought was truly going to be groundbreaking. Next gen, your big pillar. And every time we hear about this game a little more, it's like, no, it's still like um like a double A small seven hour experience. No, it still has pretty rudimentary combat. No, the, the actually the creative director and co-founder of the team, uh, is actually he hasn't been here basically at all during the development of this game. No, actually the game is going to be fifty dollars. No, actually you know it's like actually the game is going to be thirty FPS. It's like all of that is fine. I'm not. I don't necessarily have an issue with the game being any of those things. It's just like why was this like your big guns moment for revealing your next gen world's most powerful console ever? When like this is really just like kind of. I feel like one of many bullets in the chamber and not not your big gun. Although I guess it, I guess that ends up being more a matter of this is what they had ready to talk about at the time and they need something and Hellblade it is. But I think it's kind of in some way or another tainted the image or the expectation of this game permanently because I think everyone kind of looks at Hellblade every time as like, but this was like your big announcement game for your new next gen console and, and it's, it's you know why is it like a double A game? <laughs> so I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll do respect, of course. I'm, I'm still I'm still pretty interested in this game. I, I'm sure it will be fine. I'm definitely going to play it. I enjoyed the first one. I'm sure the second one will be wonderful, but a little weird to kind of sweep under the rug the fact that your your co-founder and creative director has, has left the team, and it's been like four years, and, and no one knew until now. So for what it's worth. All right, we'll come back to Ninja Theory with some more in, compelling news to talk about. Uh, but first, I want to talk about Star Wars Outlaws because this week we got unexpectedly a new trailer for the game. It is a, uh, a story trailer, which is really weird because I feel like normally these are trailers you get 
along with like E3 type moments. Like I, I expected a trailer like this to hit around Summer Game Fest, although the game is coming out this August. So I guess they, you know, Summer Game Fest is just a few months away from that. So I guess they're trying to get uh, a spotlight on this game in a time where it's not too busy, along with, you know, a decent amount of uh, lead up to the game releasing to get those pre-order numbers and stuff. So they're starting the the heavy marketing train for this game now. And I just, I don't know, I just, it came out of nowhere. And I think most people probably feel that way. But hey, I was really high on this game when it was announced last year. And so I was pretty eager to see the story trailer for it. Um, gotta say, having seen the story trailer, well, let's just read the little announcement, the little excerpt here. So this is VGC's write-up of it. But Ubisoft released a new story trailer for Star Wars Outlaws. Um, the trailer confirms that the game will indeed release on August 30th for Xbox Series S, X, and PC. Uh, being developed by Ubisoft Massive, Star Wars Outlaw tells the original story set between the events of Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi because every 40-plus-year-old man who has the opportunity to work on Star Wars is nostalgic for specifically that time period and nothing else. Quote, it says, Risk it all as Kay Vess, a scoundrel seeking freedom and a means to start a new life along with her companion, Nyx. Reads the official description. It says, um, fight, steal, and outwit your way through the ga uh, galaxy's crime syndicates as you join the galaxy's most wanted. Players who purchase the game um, or its newly revealed gold or ultimate edition will receive three days of early access in addition to digital goods, including the game's season pass. So, hey, taking the Xbox way uh, with things, I think that's a really good way to get those pre-order numbers up. But, all right, so... That's a little excerpt. The game's coming out August uh, 30th. From what I can tell right now with what you know, with what we're expecting this year for the, the release cadence, I think August 30th is a pretty solid spot. I really wish we had more like firm summer release dates. Like it'd be really nice to get some big games in June and July, but August, I feel like, you know, September's historically been when it starts to pick up, but in recent years we're seeing a lot more August support. So maybe in the coming years we'll start to see more publishers embrace the months of June and July. I don't know. That's just a that's just wishful thinking on my part. But anyway, let's get let's stop delaying. Let's get to the trailer. So I, I've been pretty hyped on this game. I thought the initial reveal was excellent. Uh, but watching the story trailer, it actually took my excitement for this game down a peg because while I still think the gameplay looks fucking awesome in the setting and the in the kind of, you know, whatever, the, the, the world they've set up here is pretty fucking cool. I feel like it's a good, compelling time in Star Wars history. I really, 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 really appreciate the fact that it's not more glow sticks versus Jedi kind of stuff because I'm really fucking tired of everything in the Star Wars universe having to be about Anakin and, and Luke Skywalker and it's really nice for them to you know I don't know it's like it's like if every movie was about if it's like if every movie had to be grounded and tell the story of modern day you know uh, the mm, world history in the past 100 years you know and then every movie you went to the theater to see was about a tech firm in San Francisco it's like okay that's 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 one place and time and, and thing and, and and area to focus your attention on, I guess. But can we tell a story about like, I don't know, France during World War Two? Can we tell a story about uh, Kuwait during the 90s? Can we tell a story about freaking, uh, the, uh, I don't know, the, the underserved uh, struggling through the devastating events of Hurricane Katrina in 2006? Can we tell a story about, God forbid, anything other than just San Francisco? You know, it's like. As a, as a reference point, it's like every fucking movie was about uh, some kind of some kind of Mark Zuckerberg like motherfucker in the city of San Francisco uh, during the 2010s. It's like that's it, it gets old pretty fast, right? So that I don't know. That's how I feel about Star Wars. Like it, it it marks itself as like this a long time ago in a galaxy far far away. It's like okay, that sounds pretty fucking big and expansive. Sounds like there's plenty of different characters and plenty of different stories to tell within this really big galaxy super far away a long, long time ago, okay? But they're like, nah, psych, everything is just actually related to this one fucking blonde bitch from a double moon planet with a with a glow stick. It's like, okay, we get it. Tell me about anything else. So inherently, I'm just really drawn to Star Wars Outlaws because not only does the gameplay look very good, but I just love that it's like the scoundrels, the outlaws, the kind of crime syndicates and shit, which is this whole different angle. Please, for the love of Christ, God Almighty, I'm begging, I'm praying, please, for the love of fuck's sake, do not trick me in this game. Do not let me get 14 hours into the main quest line just to find out in the third act, Kay Vess and her sidekick Nyx has to team up with Jedi this or Sith Lord that because I will fucking lose my shit if this game devolves into being yet another Star Wars game like that or yet another Star Wars story like that. But 
I got to say, it, 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 on its own terms, based on what we've seen up until now, I'm pretty optimistic about the characters, the setting, the time period, the the just kind of the whole layout. Where the game kind of lost me with this new trailer is just, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I feel like the writing, the exposition, the writing, the acting, just something just feels, it feels off. It feels very surface level, feels very rudimentary. It just feels like you have access to one of the most beloved and high price IP of all time. And it just feels written in a very pedestrian way. Maybe that's just because it's, it's a story trailer and they're trying to give you the most like exposition moments from the story. But I don't know. None of these performances based on the trailer, which is of course just a two minute snippet of a, a much larger game. Um, nothing really sold me uh, from this trailer. And in fact, I just kind of found most of the characters in this trailer to be a little bit obnoxious. So I was like, okay, a little less interested in this game because I don't necessarily care about any of these characters so far. And I'm not very compelled by any of the writing I've seen, but I am excited to play this game because it looks like a very fun game to play. Um, I do wish sometimes maybe we could focus on a different time period in the star Wars universe. It would be cool. I feel like we're getting to the point now. Like there's already a lot of like hit, like rewritten history on the prequel trilogy where people suddenly like it now. So like, as someone who grew up in the early 2000s, I would appreciate to see a game just like this, but maybe it's set in between the events of episodes one and two. Like, that'd be pretty fucking cool. And, you know, we're still about 10 years off from this happening, but I do look forward to the inevitable day, you know, when when it's when it's cool to retroactively appreciate the sequel trilogy. And then we can have a game that's set, like, in between the events of episodes eight and nine or something like that. So that will be cool as well. But until then, we just got to suffer through another hundred thousand star Wars, Disney plus shows and video games and novels that are all set conveniently between the events of, or before the events of, uh, 1999's, um, Phantom Menace. God, I can't, I can't speak, but I don't know. I, I don't mean to sound too. I, I know I'm always mean about star Wars and Harry Potter. I can't ever say anything nice about these things, but I am trying to be a, as, as kind and optimistic and positive as I can be, because I genuinely think this game from a gameplay perspective looks really fun. And I know a lot of people wrote it off initially. as like, okay, so it's star Wars GTA. I'm like, okay, if it is star Wars GTA, let me just be the first to say that's a million dollar idea right there. Actually, we're, we're, we're past that. That's a billion dollar idea right there. That sounds fun to me. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm still pretty excited for this game. And if the late August, early September, uh, window ends up remaining somewhat of a not too busy time for games. I will be very excited to play this day one. Although I don't know, that could be close to when Avowed comes out. We'll have to wait and see how it pans out. But as of now, I'm, I'm all in on Star Wars Outlaws. A little less hyped than I was beforehand, but still pretty excited for it. I don't know. I don't know. What like the only wanting things like for the game to have been set during the events of the prequel trilogy instead of the original trilogy. That's more like. You know, that's more like nitpicky stuff for the most part. Like, the game looks good. You got to, you know, take it for what it is. A good-looking game is a good-looking game. So, or, or at least don't do not do that thing Disney does now where, like, every time they do try to explore the prequel era, they make it look like the original. That That's, dude, that's that, that's that thing that really gets me. It's like you watch, like, the Obi-Wan show or you watch or you play, like, the Star Wars Jedi games or whatever. It's like, it's kind of fucking cool. Like, it's like, okay, this takes place, like, around the prequel era, but it just looks like the 1980s Star Wars. It's like, come on, man. Like, don't be so afraid to show the Star Trek chrome fucking weird 1950s inspired Star Wars that, that they did in the early 2000s. It's, it's okay. It happened. We can we can accept it. All right. Let's stop talking about Star Wars because I don't want to be negative for no reason at all. So we will move on and talk about an interesting quote from Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karch. Um, this is a story right up from VGC with some quotes from an IGN article. So we got a little bit of both. Um, but Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karsh um, says that he believes $70 games will eventually become a thing of the past as uh, the challenges of AAA game development continue to become ever present. So speaking to IGN in an interview, former interim COO of Embracer, uh, Karsh discussed Saber's divestment from the troubled group and he sees where Saber's place is in the market as a standalone publisher. The exec said that he believes Saber occupy a position between independent studios and AAA publishers. Karsh cited that Helldivers 2, the recently successful Helldivers 2, is an example of a type of middle market game that they would like to emulate. He told IGN that one of their upcoming titles, uh, Warhammer Space Marines 2, 
which will retail for $70, but only because he's concerned with audiences would see it as a cheaper price or would see a cheaper price as emblematic of poor quality. And to that point, he says, quote, I think that as games become more expensive to make, the $70 title is going to become a go the way of the Dodo, um, I do believe, he said. I just don't think it's sustainable. Look, you remember the hype for Cyberpunk, uh, which I think is actually ultimately the game performed okay. But when expectations, sorry, remember he's European. But when the expectations are so high and so much money is being put into the title, it's hugely risky for the company to do what it's doing. Like, what if it fails? You remember what happened when Ubisoft a couple of years ago, all their titles slipped out a year, and then all of a sudden they were an entirely different place financially? It's hard to recover from that. I think the market is going to shift a de a, uh, to development, which is not necessarily lower quality, but there's going to be an emphasis on trying to find ways to reduce costs. Karsh acknowledged that AAA development is going through a tough or through a major shift, and is uh, and he claims that the past trends of sky high budgets and lengthy development periods are not sustainable. Ending with the quote, "I think that there's going to be a real shortage of game content over the coming years. You've seen how many layoffs, uh, how many layoffs there have been, and you see how many games have gotten killed. But we have a lot of good projects going on. And I'm proud of that, and I really, really feel strongly about that. So I actually agree." 8,000% with what Karsh is saying here, and I feel like this is kind of everything I've been saying as well. However, I do also feel like what he's doing is really aptly explaining the problem while not really addressing how it's going to be solved and addressed, but still acknowledging that it will be addressed or solved or reacted to in some way, state, you know, shape or form. And I especially appreciate what he says here about uh, Warhammer Space Marines 2, where he's basically saying like, hey, this is a game that we might, you know, this is me reading between the lines a little bit, but you can, this is what you can deduct from what he's saying here. Hey, this is a game that we wouldn't necessarily be opposed to selling for like $50, $60, but we have to sell it for 70 bucks because we know damn well that if we put this game on the marketplace for 50 bucks, a lot of people are going to look at it and go, oh, Warhammer Space Marines 2, this looks cool. Then they're going to click on it and go, oh, it's only $50. That means it's like a budget game or that means it's like a short game or that doesn't have many features or that the graphics aren't as good because games that are $70 are the top of the line AAA games and games that are less than $70 are either free to play garbage or it's like double A cash grabby, glitchy, janky, budgety shit. And that is a stigma that has to be fun. I've been talking about this forever and how I think Game Pass is a huge part of the key to solving this problem where we need to encourage publishers and 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 developers to explore this space more. And the way we can uh, you know, encourage that is by supporting financially these kinds of games, by buying and playing more of these kinds of games and not maybe always engaging with the AAA game. And I know I sound like a hypocrite because I played Justice League, uh, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League a few months ago the day you know when it released for full price. But... My point still stands that, yeah, I mean, you look at games like Helldivers 2, which is like, what, 40, 50 bucks? Money well spent. Everyone loves Helldivers 2. It's a great game. It's a huge success. And the more games like that succeed and the more AAA games continue to fall and stumble over themselves and release broken and unfinished and take eight years to make and make have a, a hard time turning a profit because of the lengthy and costly development um, expense, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see more and more publishers and developers turn to this and be like, okay, how can we cut corners how, or not cut corners, but where can we cut costs? How can we roll things back? Obviously right now, AI is a huge part of that conversation is what everyone is looking to as the kind of beacon of hope to help them cut down on the costs and speed up the process, uh, more efficient and effective and powerful engines like Unreal Engine 5. And we look to the future and we think about things like new console hardware, Unreal Engine 5, AI, et cetera, et cetera. And we, and, and we hope and pray that these things will, these tools will make it easier for us to get fairly triple a experiences but at you know a reasonable a reasonable uh, development timeline and maybe not everything has to be 70 dollars. maybe we can explore that space a little more we can have games that are a little more monetized and sell them at half the price or we can have games that are just smaller shorter take less time to make and sell them at a lower cost so we can penetrate a higher percentage of the market etc etc there are obviously so many ways to explore this gaming is such a versatile uh, medium of entertainment but it has just been approached with such caution because it's really fucking dangerous to 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 inject a hundred million plus dollars into developing a game and giving a team three, five, seven years to make a game only for it to come out and be, you know, 
obliterated by a perception of fifty dollars is a budget game. I'm not buying that. Or uh, you know, this game isn't open world enough, or it doesn't have enough hours or enough content. I'm not buying that game. And these kinds of little stupid flippant things can be devastating to a game. And so obviously we got to fix that. But we also got to fix the fact that every game that comes out is bloated, has too much shit. People are only experiencing 10% of these $70 games they're buying. Um, games are taking eight years to make. Games are coming out completely fucking broken. Nothing online ever works ever. Game saves are being broken. Uh, quick resumes breaking everything. It's it's like it's like Rapture in the, in the, in the goddamn video game space where the, 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 the ground is cracking and people are falling down to hell and, 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 and God is coming down to save absolutely no one at this point in time because first, developers and publishers need to save themselves by firing tons of people, employing AI algorithms to do the work for them, and therefore giving us as consumers more affordable games this is this is great i'm glad we had this conversation now all joking aside i mean yeah it's it's such a multifaceted conversation and you know i put this at the top as a story of mild amusement a story to get us started with the conversation this week obviously we're not gonna spend two hours discussing this in great detail but it, it, it gets gets the gears in your mind turning a little bit thinking about all these different components all these different aspects and how yeah, I mean, look look on the internet. I have no problem personally as a childless adult with disposable income. I'm not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but due to the fact that I really only work for myself, my girlfriend, and a cat, uh, it's pretty reasonable for me, you know, from time to time to be like, hey, I want to play that brand new video game. It's seventy dollars, good deal, and and cash in on it. But I can understand, especially as the economy worsens, especially as people have families and and more important obligations and and, and things to commit themselves to. It's getting a little ridiculous where it's like $500 for the console, $70 for every game. Plus now every game wants you to spend additional funds on this and that. Plus it's just the other expenses of life are just out of control. I I, I get it. $70, you know, it's like it's not a lot for what you're getting, in my opinion, but it's a lot relative to what it costs to live a life today. And so I get it. Like there's got to be a way to meet the consumers at where they're at financially. There's got to be a way to get the the timeline of these games under control, you know, get games coming, you know, developed in a, in a three to four year cycle again, like we used to do. And instead of a, a seven to 20 year cycle, God forbid, uh, we can get elder Scrolls six out before I have gray, uh, armpit hair. You know, it's just that, that kind of stuff. It's like, we gotta, we got, something's gotta be done. It's not sustainable. You see stories about things like Spider-Man two, not being t- entirely profitable or being, you know, not profitable enough to justify the investments. Like that's, fucking crazy man everyone with a heartbeat that i've come into contact with has a playstation 5 and has played spider-man 2 how the fuck is that game not making hand over fist money you know when when everyone you know has played the latest and greatest game and everyone you know bought a playstation 5 just to play that game and then you find a report that says that that game didn't make enough money you know the problem is not the consumer you know the problem is not spider-man being an attractive game the problem is the way we're fucking making these games and that everything is out of control Maybe we got to make games a little less pretty. Maybe we got to have a little less fluff in the game. I don't know what the solution is. It's a little bit of A, it's a little bit of B, a little bit of AI, a little bit of this engine, a little bit of reusing the assets here and there, a little bit of scaling back the project, focusing on the meat and potatoes. It's a lot of things, but it's got to get addressed and it's got to get fixed. And I, I hope and pray that maybe $70 games do go the way of the Dodo Bird. And not necessarily because I think games should cost more than $70, but because I don't think there should be a standardized price for, for video games. I would love a far more libertarian approach to how we how we price video games. I would love a world where video games can go for as cheap as free to play all the way to two hundred dollars. Because I'll, I'll I'll say I played Suicide Squad: Kill the Justice League. I think that game would have been worth forty bucks, considering what I got out of it. I don't regret spending seventy dollars, but I think the sweet spot for a game like that would have been. 40 bucks. But, you know, on the flip side, I just played Wasteland 3 for the first time. That game's four years old. I played it through Game Pass, so I paid nothing additional to experience it. But having played it and falling in love with it like I would have, like I like I just did, the, the 40 plus hours I put into that game, I, I wouldn't mind playing or paying $150 for an experience like Wasteland 3. I'm not saying Wasteland 3 should go cost $150, but, you know, when I'm just evaluating the time I spent, the enjoyment I received from it, the value that I have placed on that game based on my the quality of my experience and time spent with it, I think that game's worth well over $60, well over $70. So I don't know, I just I think we need to bust this open and make the, the make the, the 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 spectrum of pricing a little more vague and a little more exploratory because th- this one size fits all approach isn't fucking working because I mean 
there's nothing more to say. Spider-Man sold shit tons of copies. Everyone, including your grandma, has a PS5 just so she can experience the fucking game. And it didn't make enough money. Okay, something's broken. That's that's all there is to it. So I appreciate this quote. I think it's really it's honest. It's telling. And I think it speaks to basically all the shit we're facing right now. So shout out to that. And then let's wrap up with one more little opening news story before we get into the main news this week, you guys. I mostly bring this up just because of the controversy surrounding it. Otherwise, it's just like, hey, there's a sale. But Microsoft has kicked off their spring sale, their Xbox spring sale. Um, so the promotion features savings of up to 50% off select Xbox games. There's over 1,100 games on sale. Um, so tons of things to shop from. This isn't you know unlike anything we've seen before. But lots of new games are on deep sales like Skull and Bones, Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, the new Prince of Persia game. Some of these games are like... 30, 40, 50% off right now. And, and these games are just like a month, one to three months old each. So, you know, some, some good savings here. But the reason I'm bringing this up isn't because I'm telling you guys, hey, consumers, buy, buy, buy. Uh, but because I, I just want to point out or, or or address the controversy surrounding this sale because this is maybe the third, second, third time, definitely the, at least, at least the second time, maybe the third time this has happened where, Xbox wanted to get this sale in front of people's faces. So what happened was when this sale began, the first time you boot up your Xbox after the sale began, what would happen is instead of your Xbox going straight to the home screen and being, boom, you're in the dashboard. What do you want to do? It would actually start up and then hit you with a pop-up. That would be like, the Xbox spring sale is now going on until this date. Enjoy games like... And it just shows like a little advert with, you know, saying up to 50% off. Here's a couple games that are on sale. Do you want to explore it or do you want to continue to your dashboard? And that was it. It didn't take extra time for the console to load up. If I declined it, it didn't like take extra time to load the console. It just took me straight to the dashboard. It was whatever. So I I turned this on one night. I was turning on my Xbox One in the bedroom because I was going to put on some YouTube or Disney Plus in the background as I read my book and nodded off and fell asleep. Um, But I saw the pop up and it's like, it's like 1030 at night. I'm just sitting there like scratching my face, looking at the TV. I'm like, this doesn't bother me one fucking bit, but I know somewhere, somehow people are pissed off about this. Sure enough, the next day I'm at work, I check my phone, I'm on Twitter. Everyone's bitching and moaning about the fucking pop-up screen. Xbox is letting you know there's a, there's a spring sale going on. Listen, you are totally entitled to your opinion. If, if you're like, hey, that's a little distasteful. I spent a premium amount of money to buy this console. Uh, I pay a premium price for this for this monthly subscription service. I expect you to respect me and not bombard me with ads and, and pop-ups and nasty, ugly shit like that. I understand that perspective. If for someone it's like, I'm slightly irked by this. I don't prefer this. That's tasteless. Don't do that, Xbox. I can understand and appreciate that. But for this to be a full-blown controversy where people are up in arms, people are ripping off their shirts and pulling out, un- unsheathing their sword and shield to to go into battle over this, it's like, calm the fuck down. I, I gotta be honest, if it weren't for the fact that the internet exists and, P- and we've made the unfortunate mistake of giving the everyman a voice in this world, uh, I, I, w- I would simply say that this was a pop-up that happened to me, I noted it, I moved on with my life, and I never thought of it again. But here we are having the conversation because people got to be so worked up. I mean, listen, man, again, I can respect if you don't like this approach and I can see this approach being taken to an extent that's too far. Like they do this every time I turn on my Xbox, I get a pop up for something different. Like yesterday, it was the spring sale. Then today it was like, hey, the new Ghostbusters is now available on movies to rent on, you know, oh, come and pre-download the movie. It's like, okay, that's a little bit of an overreach. It's like, I turn on my Xbox to play a video game. Why are you marketing a new movie to me? Like that's, you know, I can see if it's like, hey, Xbox Game Pass subscribers now get three free months of Spotify if you claim your offer now. It's like, that shit would be overreach. And I'd be like, okay, we don't need some bullshit every time we pop up. But if if for the first time in five or six months, my Xbox is going to start up and be like, just so you know, we've got 1,100 games on sale, some of them up to 50% off. Statistically, there's going to be at least a dozen games or so that you're going to be interested in. Do you want to check this out? Or do you want to continue to your dashboard? I'm not going to look at that and be like, ooh, I'm so offended. Ooh, I'm so, ooh, the quality of Xbox has just gone, so, ooh, I think I'm going to go sell my Xbox and buy a PlayStation because this is just really, un- this is just really tacky Xbox. Like, shut the fuck up, man. Go, go like adopt a parrot. Have that parrot die after you grow an emotional attachment to it so you can feel something that's more important and more real than this pop-up ad. That's, that's all I'm asking. I'm not saying kill the parrot. For love of Christ, don't fucking kill the bird. I'm just saying, 
Go experience something real in your life so you can realize that there are more important things to bitch and moan about than Xbox being like, hey, you want to see 50% off the new Prince of Persia? Yes, no, maybe, okay, go go back to playing fucking uh, Laser Suit Larry. Why do I always say Laser Suit Larry? I don't think they've put one of those things out since like 2004, but whatever. Guys, that's it. That's it for the opening news segments. Let's um, get into what I've been playing and all that, and then we will take a quick break and jump into the actual big chunky news. But uh, yeah, just like I said, Talking about the games I've been playing, but before I can tell you about the games I've been playing, I gotta tell you real quick about what I've been eating. And speaking of controversies, something has got to be done. Something's got to be said, okay? I'm coining it now. I'm bringing it to the attention of the people right now. Thin Onion Gate needs to start trending. It needs to be a thing. Thin Onion Gate, this cannot go on any longer. And you might be asking yourself, Jesse, what the fuck is Thin Onion Gate? Allow me to explain this atrocity that has been uh, thrust into my personal life. This, 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 this atrocity I did not ask for. I did not go looking for, but it was put upon me. So this past Saturday, for the, I don't know how the fuck this happened. I'm still praying to God and thanking him that it did. Uh, my my girlfriend was suddenly struck with the mood for, for the first time in forever to just actually just spend like a full locals day at Disney world. Just like, let's just go enjoy the uh, perk and benefit of living 20 minutes away from like the coolest goddamn place in the entire planet. And so we woke up early Saturday and we spent the whole day park open till park close at Disney's animal kingdom theme park. It was fucking awesome. It was a great day. The weather was beautiful. The crowds were surprisingly low for a Saturday. Um, It was a really wonderful day. We spent most of the day uh, just trying different snacks around the park and, and watching adorable animals. It was great. We saw some really cute um, river otters. We saw some freaking meerkats. We went on the safari and saw some some giraffes and shit. We went to see the tigers, but they were sleeping. It's all good. We had a really great day. That's not what I'm here to talk about. The thing is, I was like, hey, I want to sp- I want to celebrate this day. Like this is fun. This reminds me of the fun of like back in the day when we were, when we didn't live here, when we were tourists, when we just come here on vacation and you just spend all day every day in a Disney theme park and you'd exhaust yourself and try to do all the rides and it was it's fun. I miss that shit. So I'm like, you know what? I want to do something special to celebrate this. Let's let's like go out for dinner. Let's like we don't eat out a lot. Let's let's do something special. So I had a twenty five dollar gift card to the Rainforest Cafe because I got thank thank you Landry's. They sent me one for my birthday uh, and so. We, we go to the Rainforest Cafe restaurant that's at Disney's Animal Kingdom. And I'm like, let's have dinner here. It'll be a really fun, like, cap off to a, a great night or a great day at, at, at this theme park. And so we go to the Rainforest Cafe, which if you've ever listened to Xbox on, you know damn well Rainforest Cafe is one of the top five greatest restaurants of all time. It's not even close. Fuck you, Spago. That's right. I said it, Mr. Wolfgang Puck. Uh, Rain, Rainforest Cafe is just an absolute masterpiece of, of a restaurant and I'm always so eager and excited uh, to embark on a wild uh, meal every time I go there which is unfortunately as of late not been very often I used to go a couple times a year I feel like it's it, I mean I checked my Landry's account it says I haven't been there since last year in the month of May so it's been almost a full-blown year so needless to say this is a long overdue visit to the Rainforest Cafe so we walk in You know, I tell them, we don't have a reservation, but it's a slow day. Do you guys have a table? They go, right this fucking way. They give us, like, I swear to God, the best seat in the house. They sat us right next to the animatronic tigers. So I'm like, what the fuck? It's like, you know, usually when you're, anyone out there who usually just goes out to eat with, like, their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, you know what I'm fucking talking about. When you're a party of two, you always get the worst seat in the house. It sucks, especially when you're at Disney World and, and, you know, the average party is, like, six, seven, eight because it's big families on vacation. You always get the worst table when it's just two people. So we're expecting to be sat at the shitty little rinky table next to the bathrooms, next to the kitchen. We get, like, the best seat in the house. We're right next to the animatronic tigers right under the freaking painted-on night sky they got. It's the Rainforest Cafe. The atmosphere is amazing. It's wild. It's excellent. Anthony comes up to us. He's our server. He's wonderful. He offered excellent service. He was such a nice guy. Couldn't be happier. We're having such a splendid day. Great day at the theme park. Great weather. Great table. You know, we're at the best restaurant of all time. Suck it, Spago. Anthony's over here offering the best service I've I've ever experienced in my life. And I say, you know, today I'm not feeling fancy. I just kind of want to lean into my comfort food. I want to I want to pretend it's like 2015 again, you know, and I'm 19 years old again and I don't feel like trying quinoa or, or, or lechuga or whatever the fuck. I want to just get I just want to get a cheeseburger. I just want to be simple. I just want to be a basic child again. So I'm going to get the delicious Rainforest Burger, the one surprisingly an incredible burger. I don't know why. If you ever go to Rainforest Cafe, their burgers are just really good. And I get the Rainforest Burger, and I'm expecting the same burger I've had at this restaurant 
a million times. But when this burger comes out, I notice there are a couple things very different about it. Namely, the bun looks a little more whole wheat than white, which I'm not a fan of. Feels a little more old and stale instead of fresh and soft. And the burger bun, the burger patty looks a little thicker. I like thin patties. This is a little thicker than I'm used to. But the biggest offense of all is I notice the raw red onions that come with the Rainforest Burger are not shaved super thin on a mandolin like they normally are, like razor thin onions, but rather they are thick cut raw red onions. And I said, wait a minute, hold the fuck up. Rainforest Cafe is famous for their thin raw onions on their burgers. How could they do me like this? Now, me being a millennial, I don't complain about things when something's wrong. I just kind of take it on the chin and deal with it. So I'm like, okay, the bun's a little stale. The burger's a little thicker than than I like. And they got these thick red onions instead of the thin, really delicious ones. And so I assemble the burger and I bite into it. And you know what? The thicker patty doesn't bother me. The burger bun doesn't, I don't taste or feel the staleness. It's such a thick, well, well topped burger that it's not an issue at all. I don't mind any of the changes I, I'm noticing. The safari fries, the safari french fries that it comes with, just as good as always. Everything's great. Except these fucking onions, dude. They're so thick and they taste good. Don't get me wrong. The burger's still phenomenal. I'm having a great time, but I want those motherfucking signature famous, world famous thin onions. Okay. Here's the thing about red onion. Red onion is incredibly harsh. It is a strong, it has a strong acidic taste. It is very, it's very punchy and in your face. And the trick to eating not just red onions, but raw red onion is to cut them thin and wash them under cold water because it washes off a lot of the bitterness and the acidity and leaves you with a more sweet and subtle onion flavor. And I mean, that's, I'm not a chef. I, I, I'm such a fucking novice in the kitchen, but even I know that, right? In Rainforest Cafe, one of the things I've always loved about their burgers is they always give you a shit ton of red onion, but it's like a, a, a shit ton of it, but it's so thin. You can kind of take a little off if it's too much, or I always just eat all that they give me because, I mean, if, if the chef said this is how much red onion I should consume, uh, who am I to, to, to deny? So generally, I enjoy the red onion. It's soft, it's sweet, it's mild, it adds crunch and freshness and such a great contrast with the beefy, meaty, uh, umami-flavored burger you get there. But in this case, I'm getting a fucking onion, a ring of onion that is just as thick and, and present as the, as the burger patty itself. And I'm thinking, oh, no, no, this can't be. It's still a good burger, but it went from being a 10 out of 10 burger to being like a 9.2 out of 10 burger. And that breaks my heart a little bit because it's like, Rainforest Cafe, you are, I mean, people look to you as like the tour de force when it comes to the fucking the culinary world. People travel from all over to experience the Rainforest Cafe. And so for you to have lowered your standards and to have served me subpar standard red onions, I mean, it's literally like someone just took a chef's knife, cut a fucking thick ass ring of onion from a red onion and slapped it on my burger and called it a day. Where is the attention to detail? Where's the love? Where's the care? I want those razor thin onions. I want you to rinse them with some cold water. I want to have that stringy, super ultra thin red onion, almost like a sheet of paper. And it just adds that sweet, crispy, fresh, juicy crunch that I need from an onion. But Rainforest Cafe, I I, I will come back to you again and again. I still love you. I love you dearly. Um, everything else was great. Service was great. The seat was great. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the chicken quesadillas that used to be at the T-Rex Cafe are now back, but now they're served at the Rainforest Cafe. So that's all good shit. Um, you know, my girl got this wonderful uh, uh, curry, chicken, veggie curry dish that was also very, uh, very delicious. But I mean, come on, we got to pull it together with the onions here, Rainforest Cafe. You cannot let me down. In a world where we no longer have Disney Quest, where Epcot is a shell of its former self, where Xbox is probably exiting the home console market imminently, um, where it is no longer cool to BMX and skateboard and inline skate and people don't say radical, dude, gnarly, any of these words anymore. I am constantly being marginalized from a cultural perspective. Everything I love, everything I hold dear is getting snuffed out of this world, okay? You took away my Epcot, you took away my fucking 90s radical culture, you took away fucking ska punk, you took it all away. Everything I love, everything that made me who I am, you got Joe Rohde's out of Imagineering, where the Halo's got like multiple games that don't have uh, proper endings now, like everything is so fucked up, man, and I'm almost 30 and it's not, it's not good over here, okay? 
And now we got to add Rainforest Cafe's burgers to the list of, of things that just aren't okay. All right, I'm done. I'm done. We'll move on. All right. Speaking of being a perpetual child, as for the games I've been playing this week, really, I've, I've taken a week off of gaming. I'm going to be completely honest. The game I've been playing in my free time a little bit here, a little bit there, has been Hot Wheels Unleashed 2. I've been playing it through Game Pass, streaming it to my Logitech G Cloud, and it's it's great. I really have nothing to say. It's just more Hot Wheels Unleashed, and it's it's wonderful. Um, but I feel bad. I, I had every intention of playing Diablo 4. I had it downloaded um, between one, my girl, girlfriend becoming obsessed with Fortnite and, and me never being able to play the Xbox now because every time I get on, it's like someone's already playing on your account. It's like, eh. between that and, uh, and just this weekend, I, I don't know. I just went through like a weird, uh, a weird Disney thing. I just had to like go to Disney this weekend. So I, I, I said, fuck video games, fuck TV, fuck mowing the lawn and cleaning the floors and doing the laundry. I spent all Saturday at animal kingdom. And then all, most of Sunday I spent. Um, at, at park hopping between Magic Kingdom and, and Epcot at Disney World. Uh, it was it was a wonderful time, but then I came home and, and I, I went grocery shopping and, and got ready for work. So I really didn't, yeah, I, really my, my hobbies this week have been just going out and doing shit. And then um, as, when I had the time to play video games, I, I, I read a book instead. So I feel a little disgusted about that. Probably shouldn't have been doing that. But yeah, I went running around Disney World and I read my Kindle instead of uh, playing Diablo 4. So does that make me less of a gamer? Yeah. But does it mean I'm educated because I know about Onion Gate and you're a fucking plebeian sitting there playing goddamn Dragon's Dogma 2 like a, like, a, like a weirdo, like a guy with a fucking foot fetish? Yeah, it does mean that about you. So you should feel like shit about yourself. All right, now that we're all feeling good, now that we're all being kind and fair and equal to one another, I just want to say that's it for what I've been playing. That's it for what I've been eating. That's it for the small news stories. Let's take a quick water breathing uh, thinking break. Come back in a few minutes. And we'll get right into the news. What do you say to that? Okay, let's jump right into the news. But uh, I guess a little bit of a preface before we do that. So <clears throat> the first two stories we have to talk about both come from Windows Central. Some some exclusive inside scoops they got. And so I tried to scale these down a little bit. And, and uh, it's a lot, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So there's two parts. One's about a big departure and the other... The other one's about a big initiative from Sarah Bond. And so we'll try to talk about these in tandem to some extent. We might start with one, go into the other, and then talk about them together. But just to kind of set you up, we're going to go into these two first. It's going to be kind of extensive with the reading. But then after that, we will get into the news about Gears of War and Hellblade 2 and all those kinds of more video game related things. So just bear with me, uh, especially with these first two, because it's going to be a little bit. But starting us off with part one... These are both from Windows Central. Jez Corden had the scoop. After 26 years of Microsoft's tenure, at, or at after 26 years of Microsoft tenure, Windows Central sources indicate that Kareem Chowdhury is exiting the company. Chowdhury might be best known for uh, by Xbox fans for his quote, "It eats monsters for breakfast." Breakfast in reference to the Xbox Series X, and the quote, "It's a monster" in reference in reference to the Xbox One X. Indeed, Kareem was responsible for working on some of Microsoft's most cutting-edge projects, including developing Xbox backwards compatibility, um, along with Xbox Cloud Gaming and Microsoft's new AI division, known internally as XEM Tech, or Xbox's emerging tech team. Today is Chowdhury, or this week was Chowdhury's last uh, last day at Microsoft, according to sources familiar with the matter. Uh, the XEM Tech organization will move into a general, or will move into the general Xbox hardware organization, which is led by Rowan Sonis. Sonis. Sony's uh, is famed for her tenure uh, as an OEM expert in the Windows division, helping companies like Dell and HP get the most out of Windows for their PC manufacturing efforts. Um, Windows Central spoke to Sony's last year at Gamescom, where she made no secret of Microsoft's interest in gaming handhelds. Also, Jez Corden from Windows Central says that he's heard Jason Ronald remains as a tech advisor with Xbox uh, hardware umbrella since They've uh, seen reports in certain places where he was no longer involved in leading the charge for Xbox hardware, but in fact, he still is. In an internal memo describing um, described to the site, Windows Central, Microsoft noted that moving the AI team underneath the hardware ecosystem will accelerate innovation uh, in the space. Microsoft is known to be working on machine learning tech for improving graphics with Direct SR, as well as Xbox AI chat box, a tool to help features or, or a feature to help users solve support queries both externally and internally 
Ashley McKissick and Kevin Gamel are heading are heading up a new created organization named the Xbox Experience Platforms Team, which believes to re-energize investment in polishing the overall Xbox experience across Windows and Xbox consoles. Catherine Gluckstein will now lead the Xbox strategy and regulatory team, owing her ex- expertise and success in helping Microsoft navigate the regulator- regulatory nightmare that was the Activision Blizzard acquisition across the EU, the UK CMA, and the United States FTC. Additionally, Jennifer Cregan is moving across from Microsoft's wider advertising organization to lead analytics and business planning for Microsoft gaming team. From what Windows Central understands, Chattery's departure was circumstantial and not part of this wider reorganization that kickstarted last year. So, okay, a couple things. Kareem Chowdhury, we're just going to have to take it on, 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 you know, on faith and everything that the, his departure is purely just his decision to move. Although, uh, you don't really leave a company after 26 years. I mean, generally you'd spend a, a little bit more time to get vested or to hit a proper retirement status. So 26 years, maybe a little, I don't know. It just seems like usually people try to put in that 30. So maybe that's a little premature. It sounds like there might be something to it. But then again, he works for Microsoft, probably got made quite well up until that point and was able to retire. No problem at all. And then who's to say he's retiring at all. He could be going on to work with another company. I don't know. Point here is wish you all the best. Clearly you have a big role in all this. And to say your departure is clearly uh, is purely circumstantial when everyone else is moving in making you you know reorganizing reorganizing around uh, initiatives that you spearheaded or played a large hand in uh, sounds a little weird but I will say these moves trying to integrate AI and hardware trying to take people from Windows and Microsoft at large and move them into Xbox trying to move things together put very important people in certain positions now at Xbox from other internal Microsoft teams seems pretty fucking obvious that this is all in response to the Activision Blizzard stuff that happened last year and is yet another example of the higher ups at Microsoft looking at Xbox and saying, you guys just made the biggest acquisition in our company's history. You guys just spent a shit ton of money. You are now no longer a small little pet project and we have to treat you as a serious division of our company. And so we are putting these people in place. We are reorganizing in these ways and we are, you know, expecting these kinds of um results from these different teams you know to achieve this specific goal we're after because now that we are a serious division of microsoft we are a little more aggressive about achieving you know our our goals that we've set forth and so it's a little exciting that it's like oh microsoft is taking xbox really serious that means xbox has a lot more support and a lot more of a push to try and achieve these lofty goals and, and find the success they're looking for but also and this is the bigger one and the more concerning one Microsoft now sees Xbox as a pretty big and important division of their company. Now they're going to get their hands all over shit and start making them do things that they wouldn't want to do and maybe make them change the business in ways that we're not totally happy with. Like, I don't know, putting a shit ton of your games on PlayStation. So I don't know. It's not to say that necessarily all these things are directly related to one another, but it does stand to reason. It does appear from an outsider looking in at the stories we get and the little glimpses and teases and, and, and warning signals here and there that there's definitely been a, a, an uptick in interest from the higher ups at Microsoft to treat my, to treat Xbox like a little bit more of a serious uh, arm of the uh, arm of the company and so that's i think what we're seeing here mostly and hey yeah this plays into the idea of xbox getting a handheld it seems like there's a lot of signs point to that it plays into the ai stuff we keep hearing microsoft talk about and how the next generation of xbox hardware is clearly going to have a lot of ai related stuff in it we're seeing a lot of pcs nowadays come with dedicated ai chips so that that processing power isn't put on the cpu of a computer and i suspect that whatever the next generation of xbox uh hardware is uh will will absolutely have a dedicated ai chip in these devices whether it's a handheld or a home console or both um we will probably definitely see that be the case because microsoft is one of the spear uh spear leaders there's sp- is spearheading and one of the leaders right now in the ai space and clearly they want to use that technology to the advan- their advantage especially with xbox because gaming is in a situation now where it needs the assistive assistance it needs the power it needs the boost to make games look run perform better easier to develop easier to maintain and manage and troubleshoot and all these things because games are just becoming so finicky so cumbersome so big um, so out of control that tools like ai is at least believed from a higher up position at these kinds of companies uh, is kind of the saving grace for for this for this way of entertainment and so yeah we're seeing that done from um 
a stem to stern position within internally within Microsoft. And uh, I, I, this points to all of that. So Kareem, good luck to you. Wish you the best. Everyone else buckle up. You've seen Xbox make a lot of weird decisions lately. You've seen a lot of things change at Xbox. That's not going to stop any fucking time soon. So get ready for a whole lot more of that. I suspect that the uh, Xbox showcase in June, it will probably be, let me, let me pull it up. It's always on a Sunday. It's always early in June. So I suspect it will be June 9th. Yeah. June 9th or June 16th. Probably June 9th. Or yeah, wait, they already said it's June 9th, right? Yeah, wait, they've already, they've already said it's June 9th. I, I'm not making that up. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a good guesser. I'm just remembering something. Uh, but yeah, June 9th, I suspect that will be a day where we will learn a lot of things and start to get a better picture of where Xbox is headed and then give it another year from that. And I think we'll really start to have an idea of what, what's going on. Uh, but I, I, I very much look forward not to just seeing the games that we're going to see, which is obviously the most important and exciting part, but also just to having kind of a clearer vision of what the fuck's going on right now at Xbox. So wait till June 9th. We are about two months out from getting a serious, sizable update on the future of Xbox. Um, okay, so that's part one. Let's get into part two because now Sarah Bond gets involved. So we're back to Windows Central. Jez Corden doing some great reporting at Inside Scoop and uh, the article reads. And I tried to cut some of this stuff out to make it more concise and to leave reason to go to windowscentral.com and actually read the story yourself. But Sarah Bond was promoted to Xbox president a few short months ago and kickstarted something of a reorganization to streamline Microsoft's gaming organization and to position itself uh, for the future. With Activision Blizzard now acquired, Xbox has seen something of a gaming is seen as something of a gaming powerhouse with huge platforms across Xbox console and cloud PC, all that um, in subscription services. Even even when it comes to Game Pass subscribers, Microsoft counts various other subscription services uh, within the fold, such as Minecraft Realms, World of Warcraft subscribers, and all that. So they're counting their gaming subscriptions from all walks of life and, and watching these numbers closely. The complexity of the Xbox business is doubtlessly a huge challenge. There are some similarly huge opportunities ahead for the firm. And to that end, Sarah Bond recently sent out an email to rally her troops while also hiring while also sharing some interesting bits of news in the process. Microsoft's confirmed to Windows Central that the correspondence is genuine and reads, quote, it's been nearly six months since we came together as an organization. Our collective achievement is that in that time frame has been tremendous. Everyone should feel incredibly proud of what they've accomplished, excited about the opportunities ahead. We are moving full speed ahead in our next generation with our next generation hardware focus on delivering the biggest technological leap in any generation. Sarah also touched on Microsoft's innovation in gaming AI, understanding to be understand that to be a big part of Microsoft's vision for the future of Xbox. She says, quote, we are innovating in gaming AI focus on delivering player first developer first value for discovery, engagement and creative velocity. So again, making game development easier, shorter less expensive, less cumbersome, and therefore making it better for the player. That's the idea. Further in, Sarah describes how Microsoft is continuing to work in, to integrate Activision Blazer games into Battle.net or it, Battle.net games into Game Pass for PC and Game Pass in general. Microsoft brought Diablo 4 to Game Pass a short while ago in collaboration with the Microsoft Store platform team on the Windows side. Bond revealed, put a little highlight on that, Bond revealed that due to Diablo hitting Game Pass, Xbox has now become the number one platform for the game. Quote, we are integrating Activision Blizzard King titles into our services. When we launched Diablo 4 in a Game Pass, Xbox quickly became the number one platform for Diablo 4 players. Uh, we are integrating with Battle.net. We are launching COD Warzone Mobile and preparing for the upcoming Hellblade 2, Avowed, and Indiana Jones in the Great Circle um, launches. As part of the email sent to the team, Sarah Bond reveals that Microsoft has now set up dedicated teams to ensure the future proofing of current Xbox games library uh, against future hardware and during a paradigm shift, ensuring that games will reach or will remain accessible long into the future. Same quote. We have formed a new team dedicated to game preservation, importing, important to all of us at Xbox and the industry itself. We are building on a strong history of delivering backwards compatibility to our players, and we remain committed to bringing forward the amazing library of Xbox games for future generations of players to enjoy. Sources tell Windows Central that Microsoft may have more to share publicly on this area during their showcase on June 9th, according to The Verge. Sarah Bond also paid tribute to Kareem Chowdhury, who recently retired from Microsoft after 26 years, saying, earlier in the week we said, good, uh, we said goodbye 
where we had a goodbye party for Kareem Chowdhury, a longtime leader in Xbox. We shared stories about obstacles that we've overcome and incredible things that the team has done. As I was listening to these stories, I realized that Team Xbox embodies all those same qualities, blah, blah, blah. Sarah Bond also addressed the challenges facing a wide, uh, the wider games industry as gaming hours are increasingly concentrated around a handful of so-called black hole titles like Fortnite, Roblox, Call of Duty, where players increasingly are reluctant to try anything new. The console market has also shrunk overall since its peak in 2008, leaving platform holders wondering where the next generation of growth will come from as costs continue to increase. Quote, and this is the wrap up, at a time when gaming industry is growing or, or game industry growth is flattening, ours continues, Sarah noted, emphasizing Microsoft's ability to diversify and pivot. Microsoft's knack for di uh, diversification has helped it leapfrog Apple to retake the world's most valuable company crown. Xbox has now become bigger than Windows itself. The fact that must have might have seemed impossible 10 years ago. Huge challenges remain, but like I said, similarly huge opportunities are presenting themselves as well. So, a couple of things I want to touch on here. So, the backwards compatibility thing, I think that's the thing most outlets kind of took and ran with because it's exciting for gamers. Now, some people are like, oh, does this mean all the games that weren't backwards compatible from Xbox 360 onto modern Xboxes are going to now become backwards compatible? Hey, maybe... But I think, you know, some of that due to licensing issues, they can't really control. But I think what they mean is just trying to create a system in Xbox. And this is kind of a reiteration of what they've already said, which just like, you know, for example, the Xbox 360 storefront is closing down later this summer. And with that, we'll lose access to a bunch of games on Xbox 360, uh, whether it's buying them, downloading them or playing them online through an Xbox 360. But the cool thing is because there's this huge initiative for backwards compatibility and, and incompatibility in general in the Xbox ecosystem, all these games that are no longer available to play or to download or buy um, that are stuck on Xbox 360, well, if they're if they're compatible on Xbox One and beyond, they're still going to be accessible, playable, and provided that these publishers and developers don't shut down these specific games servers, you'll still be able to connect to Xbox network and play these games online and all these things. In fact, there are rumors that Xbox might have some big news at their June 9th event about Call of Duty where not only are they going to reveal the next Call of Duty, Call of Duty Gulf War, the new Black Ops game, but also they might have some initiative surrounding backwards compatibility and, and trying to take old Call of Duty games from like the Xbox 360 era and bring them forward and, and keep the online servers alive and well and make all the old DLC potentially accessible and free and, and so that we can preserve these games and keep them playable. And I... This is the night and day difference between Xbox's philosophy and Activision's philosophy of these kinds of games, as a side note, because Activision's approach under Bobby Kotick was very much like, hey, yeah, nobody's really clamoring to go play Modern Warfare 2 on the Xbox 360 anymore, but there's always going to be a dollar to be made by keeping that shit up on the storefront, available for the same retail price it was back in 2010, and say to people, hey, you want to buy this map pack? It's 15 fucking dollars. Buy it or move on. Um, and, and, and they made money doing that stuff is small money, but it's money nonetheless. And it didn't cost them anything really to keep that stuff up there on storefronts. But you can imagine a world where maybe Xbox looks and says, Hey, it doesn't really do us any good to take all this DLC from call of duty games from like 08, 09, 2010 and say, Hey, these are stuck on this old platform. That's not accessible anymore. And you got to spend like $70 to get all the DLC from this one COD game. And maybe it's just best to say, hey, we're not cannibalizing the success of the next Call of Duty by just making it an option for people to go back and play Call of Duty World at War and Map Pack 3 of 4, you know, from 2009 on, on the Xbox Series X. It's, if anything, we're just respecting our library and making sure that none of that content is lost to time and, and is inaccessible. And this is the stuff I truly love about Xbox because even if this is something that they do as a way to make themselves different from Sony because they need a way to compete, to flip the table and to try and build the strategy of their own. I'm all for this strategy because I'm a huge advocate as I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast is for video game preservation. In this, in this attempt to try and take the games we all know and love and grew up with and, and, and save them and preserve them because we don't really have this issue so much today with books as you know, we did hundreds of years ago where, you know, it's, it's it, writings and scriptures and, and, and philosophies and ideas and pamphlets and novels and just get lost to time because there aren't backup copies and we don't have some kind of like uh, way to preserve literature and I, the, the written word of, of man and things like that. We don't really have this issue when it comes to, uh, to, to, to books. Right. And, it's like, well, we need to take that kind of uh, that 
preservation mindset and that sense of urgency and apply it to gaming and say like, hey, we, maybe no one gives a shit about Battlefield 1943, the Xbox Live Arcade Battlefield game that was 20 bucks and came out in 2009 or 10 or whatever. But someone out there will want to care about this and it should exist. It was a game that was created that was put out into the world, enjoyed by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and it was a part of the zeitgeist and the in the history and the story of gaming. And we shouldn't let it just fall to the wayside because this corporation doesn't see the value in keeping it around anymore and there's no money to be made or juice to be squeezed out of this orange anymore. It's like at some point you got to go, hey, preserving the history, preserving the access and the ability to understand and see and know about this game is really important and critical. And the fact that Xbox is committed to doing that, to me, makes me feel pretty... It's, it's so weird because it's like on the one hand, it's like, should I continue to invest in Xbox? Are they just Is their hardware going to go away and they're just going to go to PlayStation? But then the other part of me is like, Xbox is the place I most feel confident investing myself in right now because they're so outwardly committed to making sure that nothing gets left behind. And, and, and I want to be on the platform that make sure that no game I ever played is inaccessible and lost to time. So I love that. I I'm so thrilled that this is still an important focus for them. And I look forward to seeing this continue to evolve and, and, and yield more benefit for consumers because what they did on the Xbox one generation with Xbox 360 was no small feat. And I would like to see them do a lot more than that to say the least. So I'm excited to see more of that. All right. So let's next talk about the hardware aspect. Cronky writes in says, okay, here's my conspiracy theory. So I've been thinking about Xbox going to, uh, going to take a big gamble. Oh, sorry. I think Xbox is going to take a big gamble and make a handheld device and start emphasizing that over consoles. So Sarah Bond doing her whole team that emphasizes forward compatibility will be a part of that. A team dedicated to making sure games work on new hardware. And yeah, I think they can do a lot of, AI trickery and fuckery and, and and things to be like, hey, this 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 machine now can read these games with this language and you know these kinds of games can be optimized to look and run a different way, even if it's not natively running this way. You can you know this is coming from a complete tech layman, so maybe I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but maybe you know you can make it to where it's like this game was not originally released in 2005 for this Xbox handheld console, but this machine is smart enough and has the understanding to read a game like this, see the commonality between a modern Xbox game and this game and go, here's where I can fill in the blanks. So we need to read it like this. We need to emulate this. We need to do this. And it will be able to more easily and accessibly take old games and read them. I don't know. I, I feel like the way I'm thinking this, the way I'm saying this are two very different things. The way I'm saying it sounds very fucking stupid, but you know, Basically just enable developers to make backwards compatibility so fucking easy and obvious that it's it's not a problem making old games accessible for new generations. And I really hope that's the case, whether it's a handheld, a console, or there's two SKUs and one's a console, one's a handheld. I don't fucking care. I just want to know that Xbox is dedicated to making sure that I still have access to everything from the past. And when we get a sad story like the Nintendo Wii U shop is shutting down for good you know, at least for Xbox's side of things, I don't have to worry about losing out on a bunch of great games and things that will be lost to history just because the only thing that makes money today is the new flashy shit. So I, I, I love this. I'm all for this. This is great stuff. And it's great that this is a way they're reorganizing themselves is by investing in these services and investing in this platform. Now, what I'm more concerned about is, is that platform going to be on console? Is that platform just a cloud streaming thing? Is that platform going to be put onto other platforms like PlayStation. And that's, you know, the, the million dollar question that we keep mulling over these past few weeks. The last thing I really want to touch on here is uh, Sarah Bond's point where she talks about working to integrate Activision Blizzard games and Battle.net um, into Xbox Game Pass for PC and console. Uh, because I, I, wh I went to play <laughs> Diablo 4 on my PC this weekend because I already had it downloaded on my Series X, but I'm like, maybe I'll try it on PC. And I go on my PC and it's like you open up the Game Pass for PC app and it's like Diablo 4 and it doesn't let you click download. You have to go to battle.net. You have to have the Battle.net launcher, the client, and then go into there, sign in with your Xbox account, and then it will let you download Diablo 4 on Battle.net. I'm like, this can't work like this. And you would think it's like the Bethesda storefront where it's like they're going to just make them take it down and move all their stuff over to Steam and Xbox like they did with Bethesda. But then at the same time, it's like, well, Battle.net was such a 
big thing that actually, you know, forcibly and begrudgingly worked for Xbox, despite the consumer's desires. Maybe, you know, this Xbox that wants to get a, a mobile storefront on, you know, on mobile devices and wants to try and reach more places. Maybe they don't want to get rid of Battle.net because they think there's something to learn from that service or they think there's some way to integrate it. Or maybe it's it's a brand they want to keep and use in certain ways. And we'll, we can get into that when we talk about China in a little while. But I don't know. I think maybe Battle.net isn't something they want to consolidate into Xbox. Maybe it's something they want to keep separate because they see some value in it. But as it stands right now, it's super clunky. It's super inelegant and it fucking sucks trying to access access Blizzard and Activision content from Game Pass, especially on PC. So I highly, highly recommend they do something about making that not suck so much ass, especially if Diablo 4 is mostly played on Xbox, you know, and I assume they mean through Game Pass. That means a lot of people are dealing with this frustration, and that's uh, that's not good. That's not good consumer experience. So I, I, I hope they rectify that. All right, let's move on from all this Windows Central scoop reporting and talk about something that's very exciting, something Gears and Call of Duty related. We already talked about Call of Duty just a little bit, but next, I'm really excited to talk about Gears. So this is from VGC and The Verge, a little bit of both. Uh, But Microsoft is reportedly planning to unveil a new Gears of War and Call of Duty game at its traditional Xbox Summer Showcase. Uh, The same one that I guessed was on June 9th and not because I knew it was on June 9th. That's according to The Verge, which claims that the event is currently planned for Sunday, June 9th. So it's not confirmed, but it's probably definitely confirmed. Quote, as the Xbox strategy continues to evolve inside Microsoft and Chowdhury's departure triggers more shakeups, Microsoft is in the middle of planning a new summer um, event or Xbox showcase, wrote journalist Tom Warren of The Verge. Quote, I understand that it is set to take place on Sunday, June 9th, and Microsoft is currently planning to announce a new Gears of War game at the show. A Gears announcement won't be the only new Xbox game at the show, which is also included, uh, which will also include release dates for upcoming games like Microsoft Flight Simulator 24, Avowed, Indiana Jones in the Great Circle, and of course, the new Call of Duty set to debut later in the year. The Verge Reporter's account is the second time this week word of a potential Gears of War reveal has entered the news cycle, because during the latest episode of Kind of Funny X Cast, host Paris Lilly made a prediction that Gears 6 would arrive this summer, a prediction which was seemingly verified by that episode's guest, which was none other than Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb. And says, quote, I will say I've heard some stuff might happen with Gear 6 this summer. So I think that tease sounds about right to me, Paris. That seems like what we can expect. So it seems all but confirmed. We got a June 9th, Sunday, June 9th showcase event with Xbox, Call of Duty Black Ops Gulf War, Gear 6. Expect all that to be there. Very, very exciting stuff. Um... The thing about Gear 6, though, is that it must be pretty early along development, so I don't really know what they'll have. I feel like this will be a cinematic trailer and a title splash, you know, um, which is a little unfortunate because it's like been, it's been so long since Gears 5, and Gears 5 ends on such a cliffhanger, but it is exciting nonetheless to see that we're getting some movement in the Gears franchise, especially because it's desperately needed. We haven't had um, co- the Coalition go in a while and this this generation desperately needs uh, just some grounding at this point with uh, some of the mainstays. In addition to all the new and exciting stuff, all the new teams that I've acquired that are supporting Xbox, it's just it's good to see the old reliables, your forces, your halos, your gears. And uh, this generation is sorely lacking the support from the Coalition and in that latest Gears title. So I'm really going to look forward to seeing um, that support and see that kind of more traditional Xbox IP pop, pop up and, and, and come support this uh generation that has been full of very high highs and very low lows so very excited about that all right and then with that said that will take us into our before we get into the china stuff let's talk about hellblade so this is a big one i feel like this is this is the other big controversy this is the more reasonable controversy aside from the uh, the store the the spring sale with the pop-up ad on xbox that people are complaining about so we got I guess one big chunk, what one news story really to talk about, but it's a combination of three smaller stories. So let's just talk about them all together and we can kind of attack this from different angles. So VGC's write-ups following reports from IGN, Polygon, and GamePro, which I believe is like a Dutch or German uh, games publication online. Uh, Hellblade 2, Senua's Saga developer Ninja Theory thinks that fans enjoy shorter, more focused game experiences. The Microsoft-owned team announced recently that Hellblade 2 will be released on May 21st for Xbox Series and PC. Also confirmed that the game will be digital only, costing 50 bucks and will last as long as its predecessor, which only took players about 8 hours to complete. Quote, 
I think we always set out to do what we always set out to do is to tell a story for more for the game length to be appropriate for the story that we want to tell. Ninja Theory Studio head Dom Matthews said to IGN. So it's really not a case of setting out to make a shorter experience. I think it is there is a story that we want to tell here, beginning, middle, and an end. And so the right shape and size of that experience to tell what you know what is it. So that's kind of where we start. Matthew said digital distribution has opened up a space for gamers of all shape games of all shapes and sizes. He adds, quote, I'm really pleased to see that there's a lot of people that actually enjoy a shooter, a shorter experience, something that they can sit down on a whatever Friday night, stick their headphones on, turn the lights off and kind of sink into an experience and play and who don't necessarily want something that is 50 hours or 100 hours long. So long as it's it's, it's only as long as it needs to be. And I'm one of those people. I like shorter games. I think there's a lot of pressure on people these days um, with their free time. And I think our fans, from what we hear, they enjoy shorter games uh, where our intention is, is that every step of the journey is meaningful and that there's an audience of people that want these games that are focused. So I actually wholeheartedly agree with everything he's saying. And this is the kind of stuff that makes me excited about Hellblade is I, Hellblade two is I feel like it's going to be a, a lean meat and potatoes game where they only have the stuff that they want to share with you and that the game's not going to be full of padding and nonsense and like, oh, you like that first game? Well, what if now Senua has a quick quick travel option and it's an open world game and this is a companion quest you can do and uh, friends can enter in your world and leave souls behind so you can uh, take on quests and shout. I, I love that. They're just like, no, no, no. We have a very tailored, linear, specific story we want, ex- we want players to experience. And we're going to make that because it's what we want and we think you guys will appreciate it. And at least you know when you're playing a game like Hellblade 2 that you're going to be playing a game that is a thoughtfully crafted experience from stem to stern, even if you think it's a short game, uh, as opposed to something like Far Cry 27, where it's just going to be like a really fun 15-hour campaign with 150 hours of nonsense sprinkled around a giant map just for the sake of justifying a $70 price tag and getting you to buy it. And that's, I feel bad. I always use Far Cry as the example. I love Far Cry, but you know, it's just such a great example from the point I'm trying to make. So as you know, as a side point, but I don't know. I, I, I love, I love this perspective and this point of view. And this is the kind of stuff that keeps me optimistic about Hellblade too. But then you see these other stories, which is like, wait, what? So we had the news about, uh, to me and Tony and Tony, it is leaving the, uh, leaving ninja theory so we already talked about that but with that in mind uh then we get this story where they say lastly this week's hellblade and ninja theory news concludes with a controversial announcement that hellblade 2 will only run at 30 fps with a dynamic resolution mode for series s and x this is according to a new uh, pr- a preview by game pro which reports that the game won't offer any graphics mode and that the frame rate can only be increased on the pc version the game's visual effects director, Mark Slater, um, reports reportedly told the site that the decision should make the experience feel more cinematic, similar to movies that run at 24 FPS. Another major first-party Xbox Series X and S game, Starfield, also had a frame rate locked to 30 FPS. So we got the co-creator slash uh, creative lead left the team. We got the game only runs at 30 FPS, and we got these quotes that players like shorter, more curated experiences. Eli da Silvia, or maybe it's Elida Silvia. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, it's all written as one word. So I'm just kind of guessing I'll say Eli da Silvia writes in and says, can't wait for next week's episode. When you talk about Hellblade two and it being locked to 30 FPS, which a lot of podcasters that I've been listening to have been ignoring, glossing over, um, or just giving bad takes on. Well, thank you for writing in. I appreciate you participating and uh, being here for the podcast. And thank you. I hope uh, hope we're able to do this conversation justice for you. But um, all right, let's let's talk about it. So, I don't really think the 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 co- studio co creator leaving has really much to do with this. Although I still think that is a little weird that that was just not that that was just news that wasn't really discussed or shared with the world for many many years, and it kind of had to be found out by someone being like, "Wait, where the fuck is this guy?" So I still think that's weird, but. I feel really good about this game being the shorter, more curated experience. But here's the thing. The game was announced in 2019, so over four years ago. The game was announced alongside the Xbox Series X, which is a box that's been marketed as the most powerful console of all time. The game has been teased and teased and teased, but seldomly shown. 
and they've been really gun shy about like showing off combat and showing off the expansiveness of the game. And so it's just everything with the way this game has been handled, announced, marketed alongside Xbox Series X, all these things has naturally led to an audience and a market perception that this game is going to be the most stunning looking game you've ever seen. Super groundbreaking. Next gen is all hell. Uh, it's going to take what the first game did and run with it and do something so much bigger. It's going to be the most triple A Sony killer type game that Xbox has ever made. This is their response to God of War, right? And that was kind of like the perception that was set forth. Did Microsoft ever say any of these things about the game? No. Did Ninja Theory ever say any of these things about the game? No. But is there a certain amount of insinuation that can be made when you announce this game as the way you want to introduce the world to the next generation of Xbox? Mind you, the generation of Xbox that's supposed to right the wrongs of the Xbox One, supposed to be super powerful, supposed to be all about the games, all about the gamer, and all about we have the games and we have a full, handsome library. So when you position this game in that way and then you're dodgy about it and gun shy about the game for years to come it is understandable that at the very least the perception and expectation of the audience is this game is going to give it to you this is going to be the fucking game okay so i get that now looking at a smaller team you know ninja theory is not a small team but they're a medium-sized team they're not they're not a fucking uh 343 size team you know looking at a smaller medium-sized team like ninja theory and expecting them to just go from what Hellblade 1 was to Hellblade 2 being some leaps and bounds, open world, crazy RPG experience or whatever is a little silly. But you assume they got Xbox money. They've had all these years. They probably staffed up. They have big expectations of what this game will be. But come to find out, it's just more of what the first game was, but a little prettier, a little more cinematic. Um, and again, I'm I'm cool with that. Like I'm totally down to play this game. But here here's the thing is like, with all the ways in which this game was announced and shown and talked about and discussed and marketed and teased for so many years, it is understandable that expectations got to a certain level that now it's like, wait, what? That this game is just, you know, like, I don't want this game to be anything other than what it, what the creative visionaries behind it want it to be. And that makes me happy to see that that is what this is. But it begs the question, what have you guys been doing all this time? The first Hellblade came out in what, like 2017? What have you guys been doing all these years? And I know there was Bleeding Edge as a little side project, and they got that Project Mara they're working on about mental health that's an experience but not a game or something. I don't know. So we know there's other things they're doing, and it hasn't just been Hellblade 1 to Hellblade 2, but it's been like seven years or so. So like, what the fuck are you doing? And you have Microsoft money, and you have the ability to staff up. And so what the hell have you been doing? You got a seven-hour linear adventure light on the combat action puzzly narrative driven perfectly curated game by a developer that has a proven track record of making incredibly badass over the top third part per, third person hack and slash action games and it was announced alongside and marketed with the most powerful next generation console of all time and has been seldomly shown and teased repeatedly over the past four years as like this big, big game, this big tentpole experience for Xbox. So when the game is $50 and seven to eight hours and 30 FPS, and we're just now getting it around the time where we're already talking about the next generation of Xbox, it's like, wait, 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 wait. So this isn't like Xbox's God of War moment. So this isn't like Xbox's response to The Last of Us. Oh, wait, wait. so this isn't like the next game that will define what the Xbox can be. So who's silly for, for feeling dumb here? Is it, is it, is it the consumers for interpreting and reading things that weren't there? Or is it Xbox's fault for the way they marketed and teased and discussed this game? And, and, and in some cases didn't talk about this game for the past four plus years. And that's, I think where we're at. Um, the 30 FPS thing is also frustrating if we're going to specifically key in on the FPS thing because in the earlier part of the Xbox um, Series X generation, it just kind of seemed like everything was going to be 60 FPS standard going forward. In some cases, 120 FPS because so much of the first couple of years of Xbox Series X was 
was was um was Xbox One games being brought forward or new games that are being developed for next gen and last gen at the same time. And so for the first couple of years, a lot of games on Xbox Series X and S and a lot of games on PlayStation 5 all had 60 FPS support. And now that we're finally in that part of the generation, it took a little longer than usual, but we're finally at that part of the generation where it's like, we're not really making games for Xbox One anymore. We're not really making games for PS4 anymore, although there are still more than usual. There are far fewer. Most games that are being made right now are only for the current hardware. Um, we're starting to see a lot of this 30 FPS cap. And on a game like Starfield, especially after I played it extensively, it's like, I get it. I can see why, and I can accept and understand. But a game like Hellblade 2, it's so small scale. It's so linear. It's so narratively focused. I know they have the quote about, like, it feels more cinematic running at 30 FPS because it's close to that cinematic 24 FPS that, you know, movies are shot in 24 frames per second. That's the standard frame rate for like a film, for like a movie. But how much of that is truth in a, an artistic decision? And how much of that is excuse making for the fact that the game is 30 FPS? You know? And so I have no doubt that Hellblade 2 is going to be one of the most stunning looking games I've ever played in my life. From what we've seen, it looks like it's probably one of the most visually stunning games ever. But is that more important than having your game run at a buttery smooth 60 frames per second? It just seems kind of weird to not even have the option, to not even have the option to dumb down the visual fidelity to get that 60 FPS, at least on the Xbox Series X. It just seems kind of weird. Can the console not handle it? Or is this poor optimization? Is this another example of the woes of modern game development? You guys have been working on this for what, seven years now? Like what the fuck have we been doing? So it's 30 FPS, it's a $50 game, it's a 7 to 8 hour experience, but it was marketed alongside the most powerful console ever made. The next generation of Xbox. And to me it's like, well this is certainly not as important to get as Starfield, this is certainly not as big or important as Halo Infinite, this is certainly not even as important as Indiana Jones or maybe even Avowed in some ways in terms of its ambition. So why is this being her heralded as like, the showpiece for the Xbox Series X. I just, I just find that weird. And then in addition to that, and I understand it's like back in 2019, Microsoft didn't really have Bethesda and Activision Blizzard yet. So they were working with what they had. I get it. It was probably more a matter of they used the game they had that they could uh, reveal a new console with, not necessarily the game that they thought was the best fit, but it's understandable how people got the takeaways that they got based on the way you marketed this. And then so when we see like Sarah Bond repeatedly saying things like right now we're working on the next generation of Xbox that's going to have the biggest leap we've ever seen in gaming. It's going to be the biggest generational leap ever in any generation of video game hardware ever. It's like, that's great, but you guys say a lot of shit. You guys always have the most powerful console and this and that. And then it's like we get Hellblade 2 as like the... And I want to be so careful and clear about this because I'm the one always advocating for double A games, shorter games, more bite-sized games, more budgety style games. Like there's a spectrum and I'm here for all of it. But it's like when you're talking about the tentpole game of your brand new next generation console, man, it, it, it can't be this. This can't be the game. This can't be the, you, you know, like it, if, if, uh, if, if PlayStation owned take two and rockstar, the game to define the PlayStation five for them would be Grand Theft Auto, you know? So for Xbox to buy Activision Blizzard, uh, Bethesda, and all these other teams they bought, it's like you would expect their crown jewel game, the game to announce, you know, oh, this is going to be the game to define the next generation of Xbox. Yeah, maybe expect it to not be, uh, maybe expect it to not be Hellblade 2. And maybe if Xbox had Bethesda already locked in by the time they announced the Xbox Series X, maybe they wouldn't have revealed the Xbox Series X with Hellblade 2. Maybe they would have revealed it with Starfield because they thought that was going to be the next generation brown ga groundbreaking game. I don't know. But it just seems like there is something amiss. On the one hand, I'm of many minds of this because on the one hand, it's like, I'm excited to play Hellblade 2. I think the game looks good. I'm excited to experience the artistic vision of the, of the creators and to see what it is they want to create and share with the world. And, and, and I'm for that and I support it. And I don't care that six or seven or eight hours. Like, I, I love eight-hour games. I'm always begging for more games of reasonable lengths. So this is great for me. But I'm saying I understand the frustrations around, like, the reality of this game versus the way it was announced and marketed to us over the years. Because, 
I do think there's some validity to that criticism. But keep in mind, this is something we're going to continue to see. I I don't know what it is we're giving up to get this. Because the first game I played on my Xbox Series X when I got it on launch day was Destiny 2. And I said, wow, this game looks and runs so much better on my Series X than it did on my Xbox One. It loads faster. It's in 4K. It's 60 FPS. The game's buttery smooth and fun to play. I love it. And that was my first impression of the Series X. But ever since then, it's been diminishing returns. I haven't really played anything on my Series X where I'm just like, oh, this is why we needed another generation of hardware. And so when I see a game like Hellblade 2 and the fact that it can't run at more than 30 FPS on console, it's not that I don't think the game looks stunning. It does. But it's like, I don't know. This game could have looked like a little bit less pretty. And it would have still been a very pretty game. And then it could have maybe run at 60 FPS or this game could have been a slightly less pretty game and it still would have been a very pretty game. And then it could just be an Xbox One game. So like at this point, it's like the fact that these games can't hit certain frame rates. Uh, they, there's no like j- defining gameplay mechanic or feature set that I've seen in a game that like really says like, oh, this is why Xbox Series X. Like I love my Series X because quick resume and how fast it is but like i don't know man on playstation 5 and xbox i I just don't feel like i've really seen a game that's like this is why we needed 20 billion teraflops this is why you needed to buy a new 500 hundred dollar box it's like i'm sure there's stuff under the hood that my feeble brain that doesn't doesn't know anything couldn't comprehend about why these games are so high fidelity compared to xbox one games from 10 years ago but from a complete layman just staring at the TV and looking at, you know, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League and comparing that to uh, 10 years ago when I was playing Wolfenstein, the new order or whatever on my Xbox one, I look at the two and I'm like, I don't really see the generational difference at all. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't get what's better now. I, I, I just, I just feel like I'm playing a, a snappier, faster Xbox one. And so, I don't know, like, I try not not to get too high. I'm excited about the prospect of Xbox making a handheld, but I'm not necessarily shaking in my boots. Ooh, it's going to be, ooh, it's going to be the most, uh, the most groundbreaking, revolutionary leap in power a console has ever experienced. Yeah, yeah, whatever. The most groundbreaking jump in technology was, like, the SNES to the N64 or the Xbox to the Xbox 360. Stuff like, like, those kinds of consoles come to mind. Like, when the Xbox Series Z or whatever the fuck it's called comes out, and it just looks like the Xbox Series X, but now maybe we can keep 60 FPS more regularly. I'm going to be like, great, another incremental leap. This is why last week I was saying the thing about like, if Xbox is really going to get away from this generational thing, I think they should just do it because the the jump in these consoles is so imperceptibly small to the consumer. Maybe it's big to the developers and the hardware manufacturers and the people behind the scenes, but to the end user, it's so fucking small. That's like, you might as well just iPhone the fuck out of video game hardware and stop being all hoity-toity and being like, oh, it's been seven years. Here's the next generation, more teraflops. And just be like, nah, we got a new box like every two years. And we just call it, like, do what Samsung does. Just put the fucking year model on it. Call it the Xbox 26 because it came out in 2026. And then put a new one out next in 2028 and call it Xbox 28. And it'll be the 2028 model. Like, just just do something like that at this point. And just do incremental updates like like iPhones and Androids at this point because... You brag and brag about the fidelity and the features and the next generation, the power and the capability and the performance of AI. But it's like, I don't know, man. It's I'm sure there's a good reason why Hellblade 2 doesn't run at 60 FPS. But trying to feel cinematic like a 24 frame per second film or because the Xbox Series X just isn't powerful enough just doesn't pass the sniff test for me because I'm just I'm just looking at my Xbox Series X and maybe I'm just a fucking Luddite. But I don't know. Games don't look and feel that much more next gen to me the thing i love the most about the xbox series x is that it's just fast it's just quicker snappier more responsive other than that i just feel like i'm still playing the xbox one so i don't know 30 fps it is i I guess i I understand both perspectives on this one i think it's uh it sounds a little silly to me that this game can't be 60 fps but at the same time there must be some fucking magic behind this game that prevents it from being 60 fps but if that's the case i mean Goddamn, games already look good enough. Just make it look slightly less amazing so we can have a higher frame rate if that's all it takes. I don't I don't know if it's that easy, but whatever. 
I don't know. I guess I just don't have much more to say other than that. So we'll we'll wrap it up with our final news story, which is I feel like a big deal, but not one that I necessarily have too much to say about. Although let's see, I mean, this is technically a big deal. All right. So last one, wrap up the story here from VGC. Microsoft's gaming and Microsoft gaming and NetEase have entered into an agreement to explore bringing new NetEase games to Xbox consoles and other platforms. The agreement between Xbox Maker and the Chinese gaming giant was announced alongside the news that Blizzard's titles will be made available in China. So yeah, they're bringing Blizzard games back to the Chinese market, the mainland Chinese market, after last year Activision pulled out due to licensing agreements and things like that. Activision Blizzard, which had held licensing agreements with NetEase since 2008, pulled its games from the Chinese market last January. But following Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard last year, companies have... uh, the companies have struck a renewed publishing deal that will that will allow the war, the Warcraft Studios games to return to the Chinese market sequentially starting this summer. The deal covers games Chinese players previously had access to, including WoW, Hearthstone, and other games like Warcraft, Overwatch, Diablo, and StarCraft. Quote, returning to Blizzard's legendary games, or Blizzard's legendary games, returning them to the Chinese uh, market while exploring new ways to bring new titles to Xbox demonstrates our commitment to bringing more games to more players around the world, said CEO of gaming, Phil Spencer. Over the last couple of years, NetEase has established a significant number of game development studios in the West, including Bullet Farm, which is headed by veteran Call of Duty Black Ops um, designer David Vonderhaar, uh, and World's Unit for uh, from massive former Mass Effect lead writer Matt Walters. So... Sorry, it's worlds untold. I fucked up and deleted that by accident. Uh, all right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's the typical Chinese angle from this all. But real quick, I think Microsoft clearly wants to partner with more and more big players like this. Technically, now with Activision and Blizzard under their belt, as far as game publisher goes, they're kind of number two now to Tencent. And so partnering with NetEase is a great way to try and get more Xbox into the Chinese market and more Chinese market uh access to Xbox shit and more Chinese games to the Xbox market in general. And so I think there's a desire to form a partnership here because NetEase can better compete with Tencent and uh, Xbox can better get a foothold in a market they desperately want to grow in, which is the Chinese market. And that's mainly because I think Microsoft desperately wants to get King and other mobile initiatives all over the Chinese market so they can tap into that player base and hell, maybe even get a couple Game Pass subscriptions out of it as well. Uh, because that there's just so fucking much money and so many people to be marketed to within China. So you can obviously understand how this is mutually benefit to both NetEase and Microsoft. I get that. Um, of course, it's a little slimy and shitty because even though this is an easy deal to make because now having Activision Blizzard, Microsoft's able to go, oh, we already have something we know you guys want. This is an easy point uh, of discussion, an easy entry point to, to kind of start the conversation, see what we can do. Uh, but... Again, it's doing business with the communist Chinese government because, again, as I always have to reiterate, especially for new listeners in case no one's heard before, I have no beef with the Chinese people. I like China. I like the people of China. I like their culture. I love their food. Uh, I, all good. China's awesome. I, I People are fucking great. This is purely just a beef pertaining to the Chinese government, which is absolute ass. The problem is the Chinese government runs these companies and has too much control over these companies and too many... Too high a percentage of these companies are usually operated by executives that are CCP-affiliated personnel. So what ends up happening is we're just giving more and more of our American corporations, more and more of our creative content to the hands of the Chinese government. And that I'm not cool with. I want the Chinese people to be able to play these games. And I want to be able to play the games created by the Chinese developers and creators who have great art to share with the world. I think that's great. I love cultural exchange and I'm all for a more unified bond between the people of China and the people of the U S and the people of the world. However, fuck the Chinese government. And the problem is with this comes the inevitable, uh, kowtowing that every major corporation in the West has to do when doing business with China. And so inevitably this means to some extent, Activision, Blizzard games, Xbox games, Microsoft products are going to have to be overlooked by edited and censored by the Chinese in order to, make it appropriate for that market. And what's going to happen is we're going to have creative art from creative, not free. I'm not some fucking like bleed red, white, and blue fucking ignorant fool, but you know, a nation like the U S where people are 
decidedly more free, and at least in an artistic sense, to express themselves and put their own thoughts and ideas out into the world. Those people are now going to be checked by the Chinese government's rule set, which is if you as a Western company want to do business in our country, you got to abide by our rules and be put under our scrutiny, which says you can't say this, you can't represent that in the game, you can't do this and that. And uh, this is just going to be the beginning of more and more Xbox content having to be uh, subject to the will and the whim of Chinese censorship, which I'm just not a fan of because again, Chinese people, you're cool. Chinese food, fuck yeah, it's good shit. China, the nation of China, beautiful, long history, beautiful art, incredible nation full of wonderful accomplishments and, and great history. Chinese government, eh, you can you can trip on a fucking bag of dicks and die. You, you suck. But then again, so can the U.S. government. I fucking hate them all. Anyway, the point being here, I, I just don't like this growing trend of all the Western creative fronts having to buddy up with China because there's just so much money to be made there. You got to be stupid to say no at the expense of creative freedom, artistic expression, and I don't know, decent human humanity. I mean, like we're talking about a country that is trying to deny the people of Taiwan, their statehood. We're talking about a country that has internment camps and, 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 and castrates, certain Muslim groups and, and things like this. So I, I mean, like, we're talking about some like kind of shit people and then be like, Oh yeah, here, 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 have our games, you know, pour through it and tell us what we have to take out of the game or change or remove or censor. Um, so that, you know, it, it meets your standards and, and the people can have that. So I don't love that. I, I would be, if there were a way for these corporations to be able to reach a deal with companies like Netties and be like, Hey, we would love to bring your Chinese developed games to Western audiences and maybe get some of these games on game pass. I would say that's fucking cool. I would love to play some games from Chinese developers because it's clearly something I haven't had the privilege and the honor to experience mostly because we just don't get a lot of games out of China. And if there was an opportunity to get a lot of our games into the hands of the Chinese market, I'd say that's fucking awesome. So long as the version of the game, the Chinese market is getting is the exact same version. The Western market is getting and the version of the Western market is getting slash creating is Nothing shy of the game that the creatives and the creators want to create and put out into the world for people to consume and think about and enjoy. And so when you start to get these games that can't mention Taiwan and these games that can't, you know, villainize the Chinese or communists in any way because it goes against the will of, of, of the scrutiny that a lot of these Western products get put under then we got a fucking problem. It's, 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 you know, it's the, 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 the age old case at this point, because it's been almost a fucking decade now, um, that it's, it's like this just age old example is the Disney bringing star Wars to China when the force awakens came out and the, the, the forces that be looked at the force awakens and said, huh, the black guy is like pretty, pretty prominently displayed on this poster. Huh? Let's maybe shrink him. Let's maybe like put him in the background and make him not a big deal. We don't really like, we don't really like black people here. It's like, hmm, it's kind of it's kind of a problem, right? Like maybe we uh, maybe we should tell an entity that tells you something like that. Hey, go fuck yourself. We don't want to do business with you because you're a piece of shit. But as we are all very well aware, the way it works in today's world is when you're talking to the American market, it's black lives matter, trans rights matter, LGBT inclusivity disabled characters and all the fucking things. And then when you're doing business with, with Saudi Arabia and China, it's like erase the black guy, erase the gay guy. Taiwan isn't a real country. Uh, Uyghur Muslims deserve to be in internment camps. Fuck. You know, it's like just fucking whitewashing history. And so we talk out of both sides of our mouths because at the end of the day, we don't care about human rights. We don't care about the will of the people. We don't care about creative artistic expression and, and, and the ability for people to, say what they need to say in, in, in their own creative products, but rather money, 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 money. So fuck you. Fuck everything. As always, I'm going to be the old man yelling at the clouds, bitching and moaning about it. it's weird. Cause I, when I was on Twitter reading the different outlets that were posting about this story, I was like, let me go into the comments. My assumption being that it will be two types of cartoonish people because there's only two types of people that exist on Twitter and they are all fucking fake human cartoon people. It will either be the people who are like, 
Yay! More people get to experience these games. Inclusivity, that's wonderful. China is such a great country that I have nothing to criticize about. And then the other one will be like the guy whose profile picture is like the Punisher logo with like MAGA as his banner. And he's like, the goddamn Chinese ought to be castrated and sent into the depths of hell and only Donald Trump will be the one to do it. And then it's like, you know, that that like division. But it was actually kind of worse than I expected because I looked at the comments and the comments were just full of like, we, I love Xbox. Xbox is expanding the brand and I am all for it. I love this synergy move. And when some player, when all players get access to Activision Blizzard games, we all win. It's like, okay, so now we've gone from like, being mouthpieces for like fake cartoonish versions of political spectrums. We've gone from that to just being PR talk pieces for Microsoft, the world's most valuable corporation. So that's, that's, that's fucking cool. So I don't know. I guess I, I don't really know why I bring up that last point other than to just say it's, it's disheartening that I feel, I feel like a fucking asshole. Like I need to look around my shoulder and be like, why maybe I shouldn't be saying any of this. Maybe no one wants to hear this, but at the same point at the same time, I'm just like, some someone ought to be maybe saying something like maybe we shouldn't just be like Microsoft is bringing Activision Blizzard games back to China and it's probably going to be done unconditionally and they're going to do it with NetEase, a giant fucking corporation that is uh, heavily influenced by the Communist Party of China. It's like okay, maybe maybe we should levy some criticism to the fact that this is happening, but from a strategic business point of view, because it's not about the rights of people, it's not about humanity, it's not about equality for all and a good healthy. Um, free and expressive life. It is about money. Uh, and so from that perspective, that actually matters. Fuck you, everyone else. Fuck you, minority groups that were mentioned. We just care about the money. This is a great opportunity for Microsoft to get their products, subscription services, games, and um, and um, storefronts in the face of the Chinese public. And this is a great opportunity for NetEase to get access to one of the biggest publishers gaming catalog in an effort to compete with their number one competitor, Tencent. So we money. All right. I, I'm sorry. That's about as optimistic as I can get about that one. So that's it for all the big news stories. You guys, I feel like, again, big news week, a lot of shit's happening here. And I, as we approach that June 9th, Sunday, June 9th, baby, year six, let's fucking do it. I want to, I want to see what happens. I want to see if uh, Marcus Phoenix gets a tramp stamp and and uh, falls in love with the fucking with the cog or something. I don't know what I'm saying. Guys, let's move into the important enough news stories. Stories important enough to make the podcast, but not important enough to warrant their own discussions. Starting with the layoffs of the week. Unfortunately, we do have something to talk about, but it's only one for whatever that's worth. Last week, we talked about Relic spinning off from Sega and going independent. But after that news, we had some bad news to follow up with because following their independence, Relic Entertainment has announced that they are, they're, they're going to have a round of layoffs. While the company hasn't publicly put a number on the amount of affected employees, Relic Entertainment uh, or Re- Relic external development producer Robin Smalley, Smalley? Ugh, just be named Johnson so I can pronounce your name, uh, said that the studio had lost a number of amazing people, roughly 41. The Vancouver Canadian based Relic specializes in real time strategy games, including Company of Heroes, Age of Empires, and Homeworld. Thoughts to all those affected. Next one, here's some exciting news. From VGC, Amazon's Fallout TV show has been renewed for a second season. That's right, the first one isn't even out yet. It's already been renewed. Variety reports that the show, will, which will debut its first season this week on April 11th, has been renewed for a second season. Filming the second season will see production move to California as part of a tax incentive. So apparently the the, the first season of the, of the show got moved up a day. Like as of the day I'm recording this, Wednesday the 10th, the show is out. But I've checked like five times a day on Prime Video and it's not there, so I don't know if I'm being lied to, or what, I don't know what the fuck's happening there, but I'm actually very excited to see this show now, the reviews are starting to roll out, <coughs> I was expecting that the show was going to be received kind of in the, it's better than most video game adaptations for TV and movies, but it's not like The Last of Us good, that's kind of where I was expecting this to fall, it was like a solid 7 out of 10, but it seems like the reviews are wildly positive, like people are saying this show is very good, and so I don't know, man, I'm, I'm pretty hyped for this show. I was already pretty optimistic about watching it. Uh, I mean, in recent weeks, I've just gotten more and more enthusiastic about it, but, um, now I'm pretty excited. I, I, I think I'm going to watch at least the first couple episodes this weekend. We'll see. Maybe curb your enthusiasm will, will distract me too much to allow that to happen. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, the intention is definitely to start watching the show right away because it looks very good. 
Uh, next up, VGC reports Blizzard have announced a release date for World of Warcraft Cataclysm's Classic. I cannot believe that expansion is old enough to have a classic version. But the pre-expansion patch, uh, which will release on April 30th, ahead of the launch on May 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Next up, Dead Space Remake. And Star Wars Squadron Studio Motive is joining EA's wider Battlefield development team. Motive will work alongside EA Studios' DICE Criterion Ripple Effect in building Battlefield's universe across connected multiplayer experiences and single player. It also confirmed that Battlefield's 2042, Battlefield 2042's Season 7 uh, will be the last season for the game. And then finally, they said that the team is still going to continue to work on their Iron Man game, which is being led by executive producer Oliver Prolu and Ian Frazier, creative director. Um, but uh, aside from that, they're basically moving on to uh, Battlefield support work, which is a little disappointing. Apparently, they were planning on doing a Dead Space 2 remake, but they said Dead Space 1 remake uh, didn't make enough money to justify it, even though it was critically acclaimed and sold seemingly well. So that's, di- again, Spider-Man sold how many copies and didn't make enough money? So next up, speaking of Spider-Man and all things owned by Disney... Disney Games has expanded its leadership team with the appointment of former Blizzard and Ubisoft veterans. It's also promoted a, a couple of um, people, including long-serving gaming executive and uh, boss Sean Shoptow. Ray Gresco, former chief development officer of World of Warcraft Studio Blizzard, has joined Disney Games in the new role of senior VP of product and development. who will work closely with Epic the, uh, Team Development on their... Um, Developing the new universe, which will allow users to play, shop, and engage with Disney content, Pixar, Mar- Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, Avatar, who cares? During his time at Blizzard, Gresco co-led development of Overwatch and Diablo 3. Bjorn Torv- Torvkist has also joined Disney Games as VP of Technology, having previously spent 20 years as a tech leadership uh, with Ubisoft and Swedish studio Massive. During his time, he helped global teams innovate in Ubisoft's Scalar technology which is a lot of seamless multiplayer interactions in the division. Um, after many, after nearly a decade of running Marvel games, uh, Jay Ong will now lead Disney's global game licensing business across the franchises. Uh, and Haluk Mentez will, is stepping up to succeed him as game or head of games for Marvel. Gresco, Torfkis, and Ong will report directly to Disney head of gaming, Sean Shoptow, Sean Shoptow, uh, who has promoted to executive VP. So, Lots of Ubisoft Blizzard people coming into Disney. Lots of promotions. They're getting serious. Again, Disney's ramping up with their gaming in- initiatives again to get real serious because this new Fortnite epic thing that they're building, this new Disney metaverse. God, I miss Disney, Benny. All right. Gamesindustry.biz reports. This is next up. Electronic Arts is increasing their price of EA Play subscription. The standard EA Play tier will go from $5 to $6 a month and will go from $30 to $40 a year. Meanwhile, if you have the Pro subscription, which gives extra in-game rewards as well as access to publishers' latest games as soon as they launch, that is increasing from $15 a month to $17 a month or from $100 a month to or a year to $120 a year. So prices have gone up. Wonder if that will affect Game Pass in any way since uh, EA Play is included in Game Pass. The email is going out to users and subscribers right now explaining the change and that will go into effect on May 10th. And then finally... VGC reports plans for a Dead Space 2 remake. Oh, I didn't realize we did put this in here. Okay, so here it is. We come back to uh, we come back to to EA and Motive. Plans for a Dead Space 2 remake have reportedly been shelved after the first one failed to deliver commercially. That's according to Giant Bob's Jeff Grubb, who is discussing with developer Motive uh, Motive's current project following the news that EA has moved the studio to the Battlefield franchise. So yeah, it's fucking dark as hell. All right, guys, and that is going to do it for all of our news this week, which means it's time to move on over to the best segment of the podcast, the comments, the shout outs, the uh, questions and whatnot. You know how it works. You head on over to YouTube.com slash Xbox on podcast. Click on the latest episode of the show. Drop a comment. You can say anything nice, anything mean or anything in between. I don't give a shit. I will read it and we will talk about it. Last week was one of those weeks, one of those just random weeks where the episode just hit at the right time and caught a lot of people's attention, I guess, because a lot of people listened and a lot of people wrote in. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who supported the show last week or thank you to everyone who's ever supported the show. But it was really great to have all these write-ins. We have 11 comments to get to, and that's not including the 11 or the uh, comments we've already read so far in the podcast. So I really appreciate all the support, all the comments, and all you listening. It really does mean a lot to me. So to start us off, we jump in with Sam Frito. Long-time commenter, also 
uh, owner of a lonely heart says no stirring or smoking this week. Just enjoyed the podcast and said, yeah, I'm grateful for Xbox on manual transmissions, Kura and Waterford lakes and eclipse timing. Uh, Kura. That's that sushi, uh, revolving sushi bar. My friend said the place is really good. He go, he went there to get like, they had like the peanuts, like, like Snoopy toys or something. I don't know. I need to go there. I, I haven't been to a revolving sushi bar in many years. I've, I've been to a different one, but I've never been to Kura. So I, I should, uh, I should check it out. I think we got one on iDrive, which is much closer to me. So I, maybe I'll check that one out. Sam Frito. God damn it. You're an American hero and I appreciate you writing in. All right. On last week's discussion, Cargo Runner writes in and says, Great discussion. Not sure if we're just being overly optimistic, but I totally agree. I really hope Xbox is giving up on the seven-year cycle of console development at the same time as Sony. With smart delivery, they've removed the emphasis on generations. People are always desperate for the next generation after five years, so think being more iterative and keeping backwards compatibility would be a popular change in approach. Every four years would be great. A new Series X in 2026 would be perfect. It just needs to equal the PS5 Pro in power and have some new features. At the same time, give us the new UI across all platforms. Xbox desperately needs a new consistent UI with decent, reliable achievement system. The release uh, They release surfaces every one to two years, and so the design and develop they already design and develop hardware uh, intern uh, iteratively uh, cargo runner I appreciate you right in I appreciate your agreement and your uh, echoing of, of, of my kind of opinions I agree I, maybe every four years is is good maybe you don't need to do like a phone where you do every year but I don't know maybe maybe two or three years maybe three years is a good spot but yeah just every couple of years just have a new model it's like hey this one's faster slicker smoother better than the last one you don't have to upgrade to it but it's better for those who want it you just always have a new iterative version because we're just we're just not getting the quantum leap at least from the on, uh, from the consumer's endpoint that we used to get. And no matter how many times Sarah Bond or Phil Spencer tell us that the teraflops and the AI are just revolutionary, eh, at the end of the day, it's just like yeah, the Xbox is a little faster. So just don't just don't make a huge thing out of it, and then maybe that's the way to go. I don't know, but I appreciate you writing in, and I disagree full-heartedly with you, dude. The UI on Xbox is really good. I have no issues with the achievement system, but if you are having issues with the achievement system, I highly recommend you reach out to Microsoft and speak to their new AI department. I'm sure they'll have uh, lots of non-frustrating ways to help you. Joking aside, I appreciate you writing in. Have a wonderful week, Cargo Runner. Next up, Way of the Loud returns. Holy shit, it's Way of the Loud. You guys remember this guy? He says, oh shit, I'm the first one here. I totally wasn't up late drinking because I injured myself at work. I love you dudes. A uh, whole lot of love, a whole lot of man love for you and the Kronkster as well. Way of the Lau, I hope you're feeling better. I hope you're uh, healing and recovering quite well and that it's nothing irre- irreversible or nothing you know, long, long-term long or scary. But I um, appreciate you writing in. I hope you're doing well. And man, it's good to hear from you, dude. I miss you. I miss, I miss having you in the streams. Well, I mean, that's on me. I haven't streamed in so long, but I miss talking to you more regularly in the streams and all that. So it's good to see. It's good to see you, man. Hope you're well. And I hope you heal and feel better. All right. Let's talk about overnight oats because Jay Comatose writes in and says, say overnight oats one more time, one more fucking time. Jules Winfield. I had to look up who that was. That's the fictional character that Sam Jackson plays in Pulp Fiction, which is one of those movies that's on my, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's true. I've never seen Pulp Fiction in this case. So yeah, Jay Comatose. Sorry. I said overnight oats too many times. And then Parksy writes in, in response to you and says, waiting for Jesse to say he's been dining at big kahuna burger. I don't know what the fuck big kahuna burger is. Is this an innuendo? Is this a restaurant in the UK? What is this big kahuna burger? is Big Kahuna Burger is a fictional chain of Hawaiian-themed fast food restaurants that has appeared in uh, films by Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez, including Death Proof, uh, Death Proof, Four Rooms, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, From Dust Till Dawn. Okay, that's why. Uh, okay, so what you're saying is actually incredibly, incredibly related to the comment. I'm just ignorant. Let's see. Have I ever seen... What did we say, Quentin Tarantino? Have I ever seen a Tarantino movie? Let's look. Let's look. Let's look. Here's his list of movies. I've never seen Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Four Rooms, blah, blah, blah. The Shark, what? Sharkboy and Lava Girl? The fuck? Oh, oh, it was in Sharkboy and Lava Girl, but he didn't direct that. 
That'd be so fucking weird if Tarantino directed Sharkboy and Lava Girl. What if that's true? What if that's what happened? Holy crap, that'd be weird. Okay, here's his uh here's his filmography. I've never watched Kill Bill, but I've seen it in the background a lot because my mom used to watch that. Oh, idiot, dumbass moron. I've seen Django Unchained. Okay. So there's only one Tarantino movie I've ever seen. It's Django Unchained. And I've actually seen that movie like three times. That's weird. I've never seen any of his other movies, but I've seen Django Unchained three times. That movie's fucking awesome, too. I, I love that movie. Um, <laughs> it says Weinstein Company. Uh, <laughs> it's so fucking gross when you realize that pretty much everyone in Hollywood are constantly like socially cuck standing about all like virtue signaling about all this shit. But meanwhile, they work for and with all these really unsavory fucks that. <laughs> you know, at least half of these people had to have known how scummy and disgusting some of these people were. I just, I love like the, oh, I didn't know. Oops, I didn't know. Anyway, I don't give a shit. Tarantino, uh, I like Django Unchained. Good job with that movie. The other ones, uh, maybe I'll watch some of them. Some, I don't know. Fucking can't promise anything. Let's move on. EA, dude, what is happening? It's like the return of people I haven't seen in like two years. EA's King writes in, of course. It's the A.E.'s King, but I always say E.A.'s King. And it says, how dare you insult f- uh, fruits? Mango is a big win. E.A.'s King, fruit is fine. I like I like dark cherries and uh, mangoes are good. And I like fruits. It's just, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't create, my girlfriend's obsessed with fruit. She loves to, like, we go to the store. She's like, oh my God, they have a whole watermelon. Can we buy this? I'm like, we don't need a whole fucking watermelon, dude. Get a Hershey's bar like a normal human. I don't know. No disrespect. Mango's fine. It's just, I don't know. I'm not I'm not craving mango. I just don't go nuts for fruit. I like fruit. I just don't go nuts for it. All right. Park C writes in. This is his individual comment, not a response to someone else. Talking about Xbox's UI and says, Long time listener, Jesse. It's been, it's been a minute, man. Welcome back. Was just finishing this week's episode when the Xbox UI subject was brought up. The end of the Xbox One generation, Xbox really nailed the UI. And going into the series generation, the UI has gotten little tweaks here and there. They've nailed it. I really wish, uh, or I wish I had something more to add because I really love hearing you engage with the community. I'll try to think of something more to say in the future. Well, that's all good, Parksy. I just appreciate you writing in. It's good to hear from you. I hope you're well. Yeah, I, I don't understand this criticism of Xbox UI. I understand that every time they changed the UI in the Xbox 360 generation, it was so drastically different that I was like, what the fuck? And I don't love the Xbox 360 UI in the last couple of years of that console's lifespan, but it is mostly pretty great. And of course, everyone's nostalgic for the blades, the original Xbox 360 blades menu, of course, who couldn't, who couldn't love that. It was, it was very cool. I personally am partial to the 2008 Xbox dashboard, the first update that had avatars. I think that is peak Xbox 360 UI. Um, and then, dude, I'm sorry, Xbox One into Xbox uh, Series, like, it was Windows 8 into X- Windows 10, they all look great, I especially love Xbox One's UI, I, I fucking, oh, you guys are, fuck you guys, buy Windows Phone, buy, here's what I need you to do, create, get with your fucking boy, Quentin Tarantino, since his movies are so great, create a fucking time machine, like in, like in his movie Hot Tub Time Machine 2, and then go back in time to 2012, buy a Surface Pro, buy a Nokia Lumia, uh, get Xbox One, and say, fuck you iPhone, fuck you PlayStation, fuck you MacBook, fuck you Lenovo, fuck you all those things, and just embrace it, dude. Embrace it, because we had it so good, dude. We had Microsoft Band 2, we had the Surface Oh my God. Do you remember when the fucking surface book was revealed in 2015 legendary moment? The surface pro three is when we really started taking off with surface pro, especially once you get to surface pro four fucking Lumia 920 Lumia 1520, 1520, the greatest smartphone of all time. Still to this day, even though it was released in 2013, the Xbox one criminally underrated you guys go back in time and realize Microsoft wasn't the problem. Everyone else was the problem. If you didn't have a Zune, if you didn't have a Windows phone, if you didn't play Xbox One over PS4, if you didn't buy a Surface, and if you didn't say yes to at least two or three of those things I just listed off, you are the problem. And so next time the solar eclipses and you all go blind and and, and, and God says, where 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 is your God now? Just think about the fact that you were too busy fucking looking up nudie pictures of, 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 of 40-year-old women on your iPhone 6 Max. And it's your fault. It's your fucking fault. Everything went wrong. Maybe if you didn't do that, Bungie would have stayed with Microsoft. 
and then we then, then they'd make a Halo game. I don't know. All right, next up, Mike Clark writes in, and I just put as the comment subject, Mike Clark. It's a lengthy one, so buckle up. He says, my last post this week. Sorry I had to re-listen re uh, to the show. And while I love your food stuff, I feel it is my responsibility to inform you that those overnight oats you're eating might as well be M&Ms. They are useless and have zero nutritional value unless you enjoy spiking your glucose. Only say this because I care. All right, let me stop there for a second. I can't handle this. I appreciate you looking out for me. I can't handle this whole like, you should eat this. It's really good for you. And then someone else tells you, don't eat that. It's terrible for you. Dude, This I had an example of this happen today at work. Like I try to avoid red meat as much as possible. I try not to eat pork and beef. Beef is like a guilty pleasure, special occasion. We're going out to eat. I'll have beef. Pork, I just try to avoid as much as possible. But like when it comes to meat, I'm like chicken, fish, you know, like it's like salmon, white fish, chicken, turkey. Like I try to keep it to that. And then even to the point where I try to eat vegetarian like two times a week or something just to, you know, cause like I'm not trying to get prostate cancer or anything. And then my fucking coworker comes up to me today and goes, do you see that new, that new study that says that eating too much chicken, uh, it, it can greatly increase your chance of prostate cancer. I'm like, great. Give me fucking seven times of prostate cancer at this point, because I avoided red meat to get away from the prostate cancer. And now you're telling me the chicken's giving me the prostate. Can I can't stand this. So when everyone says overnight oats are such a great healthy thing to eat because they're high in fiber and because the chia seeds have a ton of protein and because it will keep you full and you can eat fucking overnight oats in the morning and basically stay full throughout the whole day and then save your calories for dinner time and then you come in here busting down my doors of hopes and aspirations telling me the overnight oats are killing me, that I'm eating the M&Ms, that I'm eating the green M&M that used to be a hot slutty chick who's now kind of a more conservative quote unquote progressive chick that Tucker Carlson has a weird sexual fashion uh, obsession with that I'm eating green M&Ms and nothing more like you're killing me, man. First of all, it's dark chocolate I'm putting in there. I'm not putting in. It's not fucking Hershey's Kisses. I'm putting dark chocolate in there. It's predominantly just oats, oat milk, and chia seeds. And then I sweeten the deal with a little bit of dark chocolate, okay? So I might as well be eating M&Ms. And then your comment sent me down a spiral of fucking, of fucking insecurity. So I go Bing in the fuck because, yeah, I supported Windows Phone. I support Zune. I support Surface. I use Bing, not Google. And so I'm binging down the rabbit hole about are overnight oats good for you? And when you cite, when you type in, are overnight oats good for you? You get 75,000 results that are like, overnight oats are so healthy. Great way to start your day. And then you erase the search and you restart and you go, are overnight oats bad for you? And then you get 75,000 results that are like, overnight oats are high in glucose and sucrose and will make you fat. And you should only eat them after a workout because that's when your body needs the carbs. Don't eat them first thing in the morning because you don't need carbs that early in the morning or else your body will produce too much sugar, which will spike your blood pressure and make you fat. And I'm like, fuck you. Fuck you health. Go to Rainforest Cafe and get the burger. Even with the thicker onions, still pretty good. All right. Anyway, Mike Clark, thank you. You continue on with a little scenario. You say Xbox. Philip took over Xbox and he has taken the brand many directions and none has grown Xbox. The company is about the lack of growth. And I wonder who has been in charge for the decade. Phil chases his tail with cloud is easier than console. So it's the future. No game pass flat fee is the way to get people to enter the ecosystem uh, to play more games cheaper. It's the future uh, to Nope. Console is dead. Uh, ever, <laughs> ever upgrading PC hardware is the future. I want an Xbox handheld. You can imagine that after the Wii U, Nintendo just released another Wii U, but slightly more powerful and expected a different result. Regardless, Hellblade 2 comes out in six weeks and I expect it to be fantastic despite Phil and Matt Booty. Then we wait until who knows when for Avowed and Indie to come out. I think Avowed is September, August, and Indie is probably November. P.S. Glad you enjoyed Wasteland 3. Time to expand your horizons further and play Tales of Arise. Uh, features normal sized tit anime girls and a few boys with some cool combat and good story. Great show as always, Jesse. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I think as I mentioned once, when I got my Logitech G Cloud, I was like, cool, I'm going to play Tales of Arise and then got distracted because while looking for Tales of Arise, I came across Wasteland 3 and played that instead. So actually, that was the plan all along. So I do plan on getting to Tales of Arise though. Um, 
All right, a couple ways we could take this. So, yeah, your point about Phil always chasing the wrong things, and then when it comes to hardware, they just release the same mistake twice. I buy that, but I don't. I think a lot of what hurt P- Xbox One and Xbox Series X, well, it wasn't that Xbox Series X is just Xbox One, but more powerful. I think the problem is Xbox One f- failed because it was marketed as and announced as this all-in-one entertainment device, TV, 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 Connect, $500 instead of $400. And because our world isn't run by good ideas and creativity and um, new and exciting innovations, it's more run by who had the coolest disc. I mean, that's why, I mean, the whole world is run by hip-hop artists with disc tracks, man, at this point. So it's, it's basically... PlayStation had the better disc track in, in, in 2013 when they came out and said $400, fuck you, Xbox, you're dumb and we're cool. And it was because of that that optics game that PlayStation won. And Xbox never came back and, and won or, or made up lost ground because it, they were never able to keep up with the software and they were never able to have a cool moment where PlayStation tripped and fell and they were able to look cool and badass. And so it just became this kind of snowballing spiral effect plus... PlayStation just has more of a built-in legacy audience. So I, I don't really think the problem... I, I don't I don't blame Xbox's woes on Xbox Series X just being a more powerful Xbox One. I blame it more on the damage that they did last time was at the worst possible time you could do that damage, and it was in some sense irreversible. And then also on the fact that Xbox still, despite all the studios they own, just has not had a moment yet. It's the thing I'm always talking about. They just haven't had that 12 to 18 month moment of just like fucking water cooler moment, banger after banger after banger. They just haven't fucking had one of those moments and they desperately need one. And Halo Infinite didn't bring it. Starfield didn't bring it. Redfall didn't bring it. 2022 was a fucking miss altogether. Could this be the year? Does Hellblade 2 fucking bring it? Followed by Avowed bringing it? Does Indiana Jones then come out a few months later and bring it i don't fucking know if it does then maybe xbox finally experiences one of those moments i doubt it my guess is that hellblade 2 is going to be pretty well received not the game xbox fans are looking for it's going to do pretty all right overall and then people are going to move on and then vow is going to come out and be like a 7.5 out of 10 and people are going to say it's fun but it feels like a game i played in the 360 generation and then indiana jones is going to come out and be like it's really cool but it's not on playstation yet so i don't like it that much and then it's going to get like an 8.2 out of 10 and that's my prediction for this year with xbox but if i'm wrong if avowed and hellblade and indiana jones all come out and they have like dragon's dogma or um or god of war 2018 or um Elden Ring tier kind of like reactions and responses from from general audiences, then that that's when we start to see can Xbox compete? But Xbox just hasn't had those kinds of moments. They PlayStation killed it ever since you know Xbox fumbled with Uncharted games and Last of Us games and Ghost of Tsushima and Horizon and God of War and Spider Man. All these games that just keep getting the attention and capturing the hearts and minds of gamers. And Xbox keeps coming out with games that are like. Introducing Halo 5 and Gears 5. These games are great for Jesse and pretty much no one else, apparently, because no one else cares. And I I don't know what to say. It's just, they just, they can't get that cadence. They can't get that hit. They can't get that moment. I just, I still think that's what's hitting them more than anything. But yes, I do agree that Phil is a little bit of just all fucking over the place. And a little focus and concentration on being great at one thing could lead to a better xbox in terms of the console space but at this point they are so focused on trying to grow the brand outside of hardware that it's it's just such a fucking mood point at the you know by now i mean fucking sarah bond and her quote we were reading earlier was talking about how she's like we're the only console manufacturer you know expanding and experiencing growth after the console market has reached its maximum growth point in 2008 it's like okay well the reason playstation isn't expanding outside of consoles is because they're eating your fucking lunch right now but okay you know, so I, I understand the talking out both sides of their mouth, the, the the saying this, then that, the focusing on so many things but never mastering one. It's frustrating and no doubt part of the reason why Xbox is in the position they're in. But if they can pull this off, it will put them where they'd much rather be than just a console manufacturer competing with PlayStation, nothing more. All right. Thank you for writing in. Next up. Kronky says, and this is in regards to quick quick resume having issues, because last week I complained about 
Wasteland 3 having a lot of issues with Quick Resume. Kronky says, to be fair with Wasteland 3, I have Quick Resume issues a lot with games where I'm nervous to use that feature in general. It's a great feature, but it makes games glitchy and more prone to crashing. It does sound like Wasteland 3 might be worse than average based on what you said, though. Um, but yeah, maybe it's Quick Resume. And that's that's a fair point. I'm glad you pointed that out because I, I don't want to necessarily blame it on the game if it's Quick Resume, but, but still... That was a very frustrating moment I experienced. Arctic Chief also writes in, Arctic Chief, this motherfucker, I love this man. He says, I personally think the issues with Quick Resume are related to these always online type of games. It's like games or game, a game or games um, can't tell you when, when you shut it down so it acts like you're still connected. Also, did you see that Destiny 2 gameplay trailer? Too damn excited. Yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't put it in the in the notes, but yes, the, the trailer for Destiny 2 The Final Shape came out. Um, coming out June 10th, looks fucking great. I watched the gameplay, looks so good. I'm I'm very excited for this expansion. I'm very excited to have a reason to be hyped and get back into Destiny for a little while. Um, I'm very excited for this. Although they were also talking about how they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah Destiny 2, uh, or the final shape is not the end of Destiny. It's just the end of the um, the light versus uh, dark saga or whatever they called it. I'm like, oh, okay. I thought we were finally moving away from Destiny. So what the fuck does that mean? We're like. Who's going to make more Destiny if you guys are moving on to other games? I, I don't know where we are. I'm very excited for Destiny, um, uh, for, for for the final shape. But I'm also a little like, what the fuck happens to Bungie and Destiny after this? So apprehensive, nervous, excited, lots of feelings when it comes to Destiny. Arctic Chief, thank you for hanging in. Glad you're here. Physical Game Woes. Veofax writes in, thank you for hanging in. I believe first time commenter and says, no Xbox equals no frills. No digital or Xbox digital only equals you own nothing. Nobody here cares about that though. Um, seems like a lot of you guys uh, cared about that. Actually, there's some replies and stuff, but um, I, I understand. It's like you want to have the Xbox, you want to have the games. But listen, whether it's because Game Pass encouraging people to not buy games anymore, or it's just the habits of the market. I mean, listen, man, you don't buy physical games for your iPhone. You don't buy physical things for PCs anymore. Uh, this is just where people are moving. And even platforms like Nintendo that don't have digital only versions uh, of their hardware still are selling disproportionately digital over physical. And Nintendo's selling most of their games to kids. You know, most kids are getting fucking Nintendo point cards and shit instead of physical games these days. So it's just where the market is inevitably heading. And I understand the frustration I feel for the physical collecting fans, but I wouldn't necessarily like equate the digital versus physical game woes to like, the console existing versus not existing woes. Although maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe they are more related than I think that where it's, um, where it's, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't care when you're losing your, uh, physical games for digital only, but then when you lose your physical hardware for streaming hardware, you know, streaming games and streaming consoles to other devices, suddenly you have a problem. It's that it's like fair enough. I guess I just want to be able to run games natively off a home console sitting in, my living room on the couch with a controller that's all hooked up to the TV in the box. And I want that experience. So I guess that's what I'm talking about. But anyway, thank you for writing in. And then our final wrap up comment this week comes from none other than always oh, say the best for last Mr. Head hunting halo. He says just completed my second walkthrough of final fantasy 16. And now we wait until the next DLC also got the platinum. It took me 86 hours, but it's so worth it. Are you excited for the knuckles TV show on paramount plus? I love the two movies that they did. Also catch up only belongs in the trash. Amen to that part about ketchup. Headhunting Halo, this is like the third time you've written in about Final Fantasy. Um, I'm now kindly requesting, but not enforcing, that you write in about something other than Final Fantasy. Perhaps tell me about how your kid's doing at school. Tell me about what act extracurricular activities you were in involved with when you were when you were in high school. I don't know. Tell me about something, dude. Tell me about, why, why is it all about school? I don't fucking know. Am I having nightmares about high school again? Maybe. Head on to Halo, thank you for writing in. Thank you, everyone, for writing in. You guys, that's going to do it for the show. We are at the end of the road here. Xbox On has come to an end for this week, but there's always next week. So thank you all for listening, as always. Until next week, I hope you are well. I hope you have a great week. Hope you eat some yummy food. If you go to the Rainforest Cafe, maybe ask the server, can you ask them to make the onions extra thin? I like them extra thin. If you, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever it is you do, hope you're well. Hope you take care. Hope you have a great week. And until next time, Power your dreams.